so you will see you will you will have it available in the future but just for inform everybody that that will be recorded so my my main point today is is just to give you an introduction of where we are uh, so we are uh, at Minatec uh, in particular at COA in, in the com Commissariat pour l'Energie Atomique et, et les Energies Alternatives. C'est un gros uh, institut de recherche français. Il a plus... Ah, sorry. <laughs> OK. Um, it's, it's a... One, one of the biggest uh, research, research institute in France, uh, and uh, the um, it's actually his activities di is uh, divided in, divided in different uh, domain. As you can see here, there is a science domain and the, the main science domain, technological domain. Sewaleti is part of the technological domain. In particular, the technological domain is named Sewatec. In Seotec, there are three institutes. There is the LETI, where we work mainly on microelectronics. There is the LITAN, where we work, uh, they work mostly on uh, solar and new energies. There is the LIST, where main activity is software, development of new softwares. And there is a fourth one, which actually is the, are the different antenna of the Seotec in the different region of France. Okay, so let's go to Sewa Leti. Uh, Sewa Leti, it's about 2,000 people today. We have about 300 industrial partners, a square room today of about 11 square meter, 11,000 square meters, sorry. Uh, about 77 startups has been created uh, based on the research development that we uh, did here. We have a patent portfolio of about 3,400 3, patents, uh, and we apply for new patents, uh, something like 300 new patents per year. And we have a budget, an annual budget today, which is about 400, uh, 450 million euro. Main activity of the COAL late, in fact, is, a pre is in the pre-industrialization. So we are at not uh, a very low TRL, but uh, not... Uh, at uh, industrial maturity or produ uh, production. And we are actually in the middle between the academic research and uh, the industrial partner. We try to work with the academic and the industrial to speed up the introduction of the new idea into industrial uh, products. Uh, Leti has main as basically is organized by infrastructure and platform. We have a nano, nano electronics, micro and nano system platform. We have a photonic platform. We have a, a nano biotechnology platform, a Cleanatech, which is a platform between the Sewaleti and the hospital in Grenoble, where we work on new implants uh, for, uh, for, for patients, new surgeries technologies, where nanomaterials and nanoelectronics is used. Then we have a nanocaracterization platform and we have uh, a, a team working on uh, system design, AIC uh, um, conception. Uh, the in the silicon technology platform, so the clean room of the lady, we work on many different, uh, uh, I would say, device uh, from CMOS, FDS, based on F DSOI, beyond CMOS, power, MEMS, uh, embedded memories, uh, memories, imager, display, silicon photonic, 3D integration, and new su substrates. Okay, uh, now I um, just want to just a couple of words uh, concerning uh, the inline metrology, uh, because we are uh, in this workshop is on characterization and metrology. So concerning the inline metrology, we have uh, eight different metrology area, as you can see in this slide, uh, divided in... Uh, so we have one team working on optical analysis, one team working on X-ray and surface analysis, another one working on electrical properties, a, a team working on mechanical properties, uh, contamination, defectivity, dimensional analysis, and inline electron microscope. So as I said, this is inline means that all these uh, methodologies are available are available in the in the production in no, I will say in the R and D uh, clean room line, and are necessary to follow up all, all of our process. 
but sometimes we need to go uh i will some for some uh, developments we need to go deeper and for this reason we have a nano characterization platform which is market ideas has been created in 2006 today we have about 100 a little more than 100 uh, uh, people working uh, and uh, in these 100 people 55 percent is are permanent and the other are postdoc, PhD students, uh, and uh, uh, people that are doing their stage. Uh, we have about 50 advanced tools in the platform, uh, and we have a cumulative investment of about 40 million and an, an operative budget of about 2.3 million. In the nano characterization platform, we publish about 90 publications per year. And uh, we have a pa patent portfolio of about 50 patents uh, ju uh, just on uh, characterization methodologies. And we have five industrial partners. And lab the labs are uh, spread over 3,600 square meters. Uh, this platform is used by the LATI, but it's also used by two other uh, institutes of the COA. In the LITEN, as I said before, is still in the uh, technical research, and the IRIG, which actually more in the fundamental research. So we share the equipment, uh, and this is very useful because uh, all people are in the same buildings, they have access to the same equipment, so they can discuss be between them, and see it's really a way to reach a critical mass of equipment, but I will say of brain, uh, to work on uh, developing new methodologies. In introducing them in the industry from from our side. <clears throat> uh, uh, see, the platform, the main activity carried out on the platform, as I said, is the developing uh, character, uh, new characterization and then transfer them to the industry, but also supporting uh, what our our um, the different departments of, of late are realizing in the green room uh, to help them uh, to study new materials and new devices. The nano characterization platform is also organized in, uh, in center of expertise. I will say there are eight center of expertise, uh, which are uh, electron microscopy, scanning microscopy, magnetic resonance, ion beam analysis, surface, uh, optical analysis, uh, X-ray sample preparation and, uh, and electron microscopy. And there is also uh, another team, which is actually is not uh, clearly identified because it's spread between the different uh, uh, competent centers, which is a digital development, and they are in charge to develop new algorithms, new, uh, I will say, software development in support of the characterization. Yeah, there are just some examples of uh, what we what, what we have, so morphological, some example of morphological and dimensional analysis some example of mechanical and structural properties, some example on uh, elemental molecular and chemical analysis, and some example on physical properties of materials. Uh, oops. So this is all for me. Uh, I hope you will enjoy the workshop. And if you have any questions, just let me know. So there are questions uh, from people in remote. Uh, no, perfect. Anyway, I'm here for the next uh, today and tomorrow. So if you have any questions, just contact us and I will answer you. So enjoy your workshop. Thank you. Thank you, Narciso. So, OK. Let's start with more here. Okay, it works. Awesome. Hi, everyone. I'm Marta. I work for our Warrant Hub, which is a company that uh, it's a consultancy company that helps um, companies uh, in various different things. Like in this case, we and myself are focused more on the European uh, um, funding and in European projects. And I'm here to present, to introduce a bit about the, the school. So we have already started with the arrival and the lunch that we have 
we've all enjoyed. And uh, thank you, Narciso, for the introduction about the SEA. We will then start with more um, focused presentations on uh, strain engineering, on metrology, on strain char characterization models. We will have then a coffee break and we will resume with the uh, metrological Ramos spectroscopy, the X strain analysis, and uh, uh, optical spectroscopy. And I will give the floor to Elena, which is here, to present the strain engineering in material science. And I will open your presentation. Elena, yes, it's this one. Good afternoon to everyone. Um, Mm -hmm. oh. Wait. Fenêtre et Okay. okay. It's fine. Okay. So good afternoon to everyone. Uh, I'm Elena Stellino and I'm a researcher in physics at the Department of Basic and Applied Sciences for Engineering in the Sapienza University of Rome. Um, my research field is the um, experimental solid state physics and in particular I'm specialized in optical spectroscopies like Raman, photoluminescence and infrared uh, coupled with the high pressure techniques. Um, how can I go? <laughs> oh, okay, maybe. Okay. Okay. Um, here you can see the outline of this lecture in which I have tried to put a little bit of my expertise. Um, we will start with a brief introduction about strain, uh, just to set some formal basis, and then we will um, investigate, discuss the physical effects of uh, the application of strain on the vibrational and electronic properties of crystals. And from this very general background, then we will focus in particular on two-dimensional materials. We will see how different strain components can be transferred uh, to two-dimensional lattices, and we will see how these different strain components modify the vibrational and optoelectronic response of our samples, um, exploiting um, mostly Raman and uh, photoluminescence spectroscopy. Uh, but let's start from the beginning. So, um, what is strain? Uh, as we all know, when we apply an external force to an object, it tends to deform. In the one-dimensional case, uh, deformation is just a measure of how much the object is stretched or compressed, and strain can be intuitively taught as the ratio between that deformation and the original length of the object. Now we will try to put this uh, very basic description of strain into more rigorous mathematical terms in order to generalize the definition of this concept. Uh, let's consider a one-dimensional system extending from a point O to a point Q. When we apply an external force, um, keeping for sake of simplicity the origin fixed, the object is uh, elongated and each point, O, P, Q, is mapped onto an equivalent point, O prime, P prime, Q prime, in the strained system. We define the displacement vector as the vector connecting each point P in the unstrained system to the equivalent point P prime in the strained system. And we define the displacement vector field as the ensemble 
of all the displacement vectors associated with the infinite points of our system. In the one-dimensional case, we know that uh, a point is univocally identified by its x1 coordinate, and therefore the displacement vector field can be uh, modeled as a numerical function in the coordinate x1. Okay, now uh, let's choose a point of our system, for example, the origin O with coordinate xO and displacement vector u of xO. Uh, the displacement vector in a point P close enough to the origin O uh, can be okay. Uh, the displacement vector of a point P uh, close enough to the origin O uh, can be written as a Taylor expansion of the displacement vector uh, um, field across the origin O in that way. Uh, the first order of this Taylor expansion, uh, in the first order of this Taylor expansion, we see that uh, the first derivative of the displacement vector field with respect to the x1 coordinate calculated in the origin is the mathematical definition of uniaxial strain uh, in the point P. And from that de definition, we learn that strain is an dimensional quantity which basically tells us how fast the displacement vector field changes between two points infinitesimally close. Uh, we can verify that this definition is very well connected with our initial intuitive description of strain. In fact, in the very simple case in which the displacement vector field can be modeled as a linear function, we see that strain is just a constant value equal to the angular coefficient of the linear function, and therefore it can be calculated as the difference in length between uh, the strained and the unstrained system divided by the initial length of the object. All uh, of the previous discussion can be clearly be generalized to the three-dimensional case in which uh, a point is identified by a triplet of coordinates, x1, x2, x3, and the displacement vector field can be modeled as a vectorial function in these coordinates. Again, to define strain, uh, we can start writing the Taylor expansion of the displacement vector function about the origin, and then we have to rule out the effects of translation and the, in the three-dimensional case, also rotation. I won't go through the, the mathematical details. What we learn in the end is that uh, in the three-dimensional case, uh, strain is a three-dimensional tensor uh, symmetrical in the coordinates x1, x2, and x3. Okay, now that we have built up a um, quite rigorous mathematical definition of strain, we can move to uh, the discussion of the physical effects of strain application on the properties of crystalline systems. As we all know, crystals are solid systems formed by a periodic arrangement of solid uh, unit cells, which can, be either, uh, which can contain either a single atom or a group of atoms. When we apply strain to a crystal, the unit cell of the system is um, deformed, leading to a modification of all the properties that are somehow connected with the structure or the symmetry of the system, like the lattice vibrational modes and the electronic band structure. In order to understand the effects of strain application on the vibrational properties of crystals, we can rely on an extremely simple model in which the system is taught as a set of massive points connected by springs. In this very basic picture, the interatomic distances, the interatomic interactions are accounted for by the elastic constant of the spring key, and the frequency of the vibrational mode is given by the square root of the elastic constant to mass ratio. When we apply a tensile strain to our lattice, the interatomic distances increase and the interatomic interactions reduce. In that situation, the elastic constant of our uh, imaginary springs gets smaller and the frequency of the vibrational mode reduces or redshifts. Conversely, uh, when we apply a compressive strain, the interatomic distances uh, reduce and the interatomic interactions increase. In that situation, the elastic constant uh, of our system uh, gets larger and the frequency of the vibrational mode increases or blue shift. Uh, besides the structure-related properties, the application of strain on crystals uh, also modifies the electronic properties. In fact, it is well understandable that in a crystal, any uh, deformation of the direct lattice is automatically mapped onto a deformation 
of the reciprocal lattice, and therefore it affects uh, the electronic band structure of the system, which is the ensemble of all the um, quantum states electron can occupy in terms of energy and momentum vector in the reciprocal space. In that case, uh, we cannot rely on toy models in order to qualitatively predict the evolution of the electronic band structure of a crystal uh, as a function of strain, but, but we need to perform accurate uh, ab initio calculations at varying the lattice parameters of our system. Okay, in the following, we are going to apply the very basic concepts uh, we have introduced so far uh, to characterize the response of two-dimensional materials to the application of different strain components, exploiting optical spectroscopic techniques, which allow assessing both the vibrational and the optoelectronic degrees of freedom. Uh, let's start with a brief introduction about the samples under consideration. Uh, Two-dimensional materials are layered crystals in which the intra-layer interactions are um, mostly covalent in nature and therefore are much stronger compared with the uh, interlayer bonds, which instead are mostly ruled by weak van der Waals interactions. Uh, due to this peculiar structure, it is relatively easy in two-dimensional materials to isolate uh, single-layer crystals. Uh, with anatomic scale thickness and therefore a quasi two-dimensional nature. The most common technique to do that is by mechanical exfoliation, firstly performed on graphite back in 2004, uh, which provides us with uh, very high quality uh, few layer flakes, but which unfortunately is not scalable. And for this reason, also epitaxial growth techniques uh, have been implemented, which allow obtaining large area low dimensional samples. Um, due to their atomicality in nature, uh, monolayer or few layer crystals in general display a much stronger deformation capacity compared with their bulk counterparts, which makes their properties highly tunable by strain application. Uh, of course, when it comes to transfer strain to um, low dimensional flakes, which in general have micrometrical lateral dimensions and nanometric thickness, uh, we cannot think of pulling or squeezing the crystal itself, but we need to rely on specific techniques, which depend also on the nature of the strain component that we want to apply. Um, a well-established method to uh, transfer a compressive strain is uh, high pressure. Uh, which is not limited to the case of two-dimensional materials. Uh, to apply high pressure, we use a device called uh, diamond anvil cell or DAC, uh, formed by two opposing diamonds with large external phases of the order of millimeters and small internal phases called culettes of the order of hundreds of microns. In that situation, uh, in that configuration, by applying a moderate force on the large external phases, we can obtain um, a great pressure at the gigapascal scale, that is 10 to the fourth atmospheres, in correspondence with the aculets. In the case of two-dimensional materials, uh, low-dimensional flakes are mechanically exfoliated in most cases and then transferred onto the culette of one of the two diamonds of the duct by a deterministic transfer system. And then pressure is applied, squeezing the crystals once, once against each other, uh, often with the help of a pressure transmitting medium, which can be either a gas or a liquid. Uh, due to the um, highly anisotropic nature of intralayer and interlayer bonds in two-dimensional materials, uh, the application of pressure on these systems mostly results in a compressive out-of-plane strain component. If we want to apply an in-plane strain, then we have to transfer our low-dimensional flake on a proper substrate, for example, a polymer or a piezoelectric material, which can be compressed or stretched in one or two directions uh, so that we can obtain an in-plane strain uh, biaxial or uniaxial, uh, compressive or tensile. Um, Another interesting situation is that of um, two-dimensional samples synthesized by epitaxial growth techniques. In this uh, case, the choice of the substrate itself plays a key role 
in determining the strain conditions of the overlayer. In particular, uh, substrates with smaller lattice parameters compared with the sample favor the growth of films with a uh, compressed lattice, while substrates with larger lattice parameters compared with the sample in general favor the growth of films with a stretched lattice. So in this case, we can say that um, the choice of the substrate determine an in-plane biaxial strain, which can be either compressive or tensile. Sorry. Okay. Uh, up to now, uh, we have discussed techniques for, for strain transfer, uh, which are purely in plane or out of plane, a pretty intuitive approach to achieve more complex strain gradients is directly modifying the crystal morphology to obtain, for example, wrinkles, bubbles, or waves with complex in plane, out of plane, tensile compressive strain components. Uh, in this case, I won't go into much detail because at the end of this lecture, uh, we will discuss together a nice case of study in which the sample under consideration is a monolayer with an unconventional shape. So we will see in that specific case how this um, exotic morphology is obtained and how the strain gradients are distributed across the surface of our sample. OK, uh, so far we have discussed how, uh, what are the effects of strain applications on the properties of crystals and how different strain components can be transferred to uh, two-dimensional uh, crystals. Uh, in the following, we are going to merge all of this information to uh, discuss some examples in which the response of specific two-dimensional crystals to the application of different strain components is investigated by Raman and photolumination spectroscopy. Uh, for sake of simplicity, all the examples I have selected involve uh, crystals belonging to the well-known family of transition metal dichalcogenides, or TMDs. Uh, these are crystals with stoichiometry MX2, in which M is a transition metal, and X is a calcogen among sulfur, selenium, or tellurium. They are characterized by a layered structure with a single layer consisting of a plane of metal atoms sandwiched between two planes of calcogens. Uh, depending on the choice of M and X atoms, uh, tin and these in general can have metallic, semiconducting, or insulating nature. In particular, uh, TMD semiconductors have attracted a huge interest in the last decades, since in most cases, when they are scaled down to their monolayer form, they exhibit a direct electronic band gap. Such characteristics make uh, monolayer TMD semiconductors uh, um, potentially exploitable in several optoelectronic applications and has motivated a great amount of research devoted to the implementation of new strategies for controlling and modulating their optoelectronic response. Uh, in this framework, uh, methods for uh, strain engineering were found to be particularly effective due to the uh, quasi-two-dimensional nature of these semiconductors. Uh, a very powerful uh, um, tool to optically characterize uh, the response of um, TMD semiconductors to the application of strain is looking at their vibrational modes in the Raman spectrum. In fact, in TMD semiconductors, intralayer Raman active modes uh, involve lattice displacements with a very well defined directionality, either out of plane in the case of the A1G mode or in plane in the case of the E1G mode. Uh, the way the frequency of these vibrational modes uh, changes under the application of strain uh, is therefore strongly connected with the nature, with the direction of the deformation applied to the crystal lattice. Uh, in the example I reported over here, for example, uh, the authors study the evolution of the Ramana spectrum of molybdenum disulfide at increasing uh, uniaxial tensile strain. As you can notice, uh, the out-of-plane A1G frequency remains practically unaffected by the application of an in-plane strain component. On the other hand, uh, we can see that the frequency of the E1 to G mode visibly redshifts uh, due to the application of tensile strain. Moreover, uh, when the 
applied strain exceeds the 0.5%, we can also notice that the E1 to G peak splits, uh, indicating the breaking of the in-plane hexagonal symmetry of the crystal lattice. Uh, when we consider high pressure measurements, on the other hand, the situation is somehow reversed. Here you can see some high pressure Raman spectra collected in our laboratory um, on molybdenum disulfide. In this case, both A1G and E1 to G peaks blue shift uh, due to the application of a compressive strain. However, as you may notice, the variation in frequency of the A1G mode is much larger compared with the variation in frequency of the in-plane E1 to G mode. Because, uh, as we have discussed before, the application of pressure on two-dimensional materials mostly results in a compressive out-of-plane uh, strain. Uh, another uh, powerful tool to characterize, in this case, the optoelectronic response of uh, TMD semiconductors to the application of strain is photoluminescence spectroscopy. Uh, here you can see a photoluminescence spectrum collected on a monolayer crystal of tungsten disulfide. As you can notice, the spectrum is characterized by the presence of two distinct bands. Uh, the band at higher energy is associated with the radiative recombination of the A exciton, that is the photoexcited uh, electron hole pair, um, which recombine, recombines through the direct band gap at the key point of the first BUN zone. The band at lower energy, on the other hand, is associated with the radiative recombination of the trion T, which is a three body system formed by two electrons in the conduction band and a hole in the valence band. Uh, the physics of trions in TMD is, is extremely rich and informative, but unfortunately, we do not have time to discuss it into much detail. So in the following, we will focus just on the excitons. As you can notice from the example reported over here, uh, under the application of in-plane tensile strain, the A exciton band of monolayer tanks and disulfide uh, redshift uh, indicating a progressive reduction in the direct band gap energy at the key point of the first BUN zone. Conversely, when we apply high pressure, uh, we notice a blue shift in the A exciton band, which is associated with an increase in the energy of the direct band gap. Okay, with these uh, very simple examples, we can say that we have uh, somehow collected the ingredients to optically characterize our um, TMD semiconductors um, as a function of strain. In the following, we are going to use all of this information uh, to discuss together a case of study. Uh, which is a very recent work from our group in which uh, we have studied by Raman and photoluminescence spectroscopy a monolayer crystal of TMD with an unconventional morphology, coupling in this case the intrinsic morphological strain of the system with the application of external pressure. Uh, the system under consideration is a monolayer bubble of tanks and disulfide. Uh, these bubbles are obtained uh, in radiating a bulk flake by protons. Uh, after impinging the bulk uh, surface, uh, protons penetrate the first external layer, and then they recombine, forming hydrogen molecules, which remain trapped in the interlayer space, forming these monolayer domes filled by gaseous hydrogen. From a geometrical point of view, bubbles can be taught and spherical caps with fixed A to radius ratio. In the case of tanks and disulfide in particular, this aspect ratio is about 0 0.13, meaning that uh, a bubble with a radius of one, two microns has a height of about 200 nanometers. Uh, due to this peculiar morphology, the monolayer undergoes a perfectly biaxial tensile strain in correspondence with the dome center, which progressively uh, becomes uniaxial tensile approaching to the borders. Now let's have a look at the Raman and photoluminescence spectra collected at the dome center at ambient conditions. Um, in the Raman spectrum, we can immediately recognize the E1 to G and A1 G peaks of the bulk substrate centered at about 350 and 420 centimeters to the minus one. 
while the corresponding bands for the monolayer dome are visibly redshifted due to the application of tensile strain. Uh, regarding the photoluminescence spectrum, we notice a very intense signal centered at about 1.8 electron volt, which is ascribable to the A exciton band of the monolayer dome. This band is visibly redshifted compared to the case of planar unstrained monolayers, again due to the application of tensile strain. Uh, as for the um, bulk contribution, in the case of the photoluminescence spectrum, it should be centered at about 1.9 electron volt. However, in this case, it's not visible because it's much less intense compared with the monolayer signal at ambient conditions. Uh, in order to perform high pressure measurements on these samples, uh, we transferred a pre-hydrogenated bulk flake with the bubbles on top uh, onto the culette of our diamond anvil cell. And then we loaded our measurement chamber with a liquid pressure transmitting medium uh, in order to apply a nearly quasi hydrostatic pressure on the dome. Uh, once identified a bubble of interest, uh, at each pressure, we collected a two dimensional uh, array of Raman measurements uh, mapping the whole bubble surface. In that way, we could uh, build up a color map in which the color of each point of the map was assigned based on the integrated signal of the A1G peak of the monolayer dome. Uh, that procedure allowed us to get an imaging of the bubble at each pressure, even in the absence of a clear visual of this micrometric system inside the diamond anvil cell. Uh, and with these measurements, uh, we could um, observe that surprisingly, the bubble diameter remains practically unchanged under the application of pressure in the 0, 0 0.5 gigapascal range. Uh, knowing the pressure evolution of the bubble diameter, we could also get an estimate for the pressure evolution of the bubble height under the assumptions that the gas inside the bubble um, follows the ideal gas law and that the bubble at each pressure can be modeled as a spherical cap. Um, under these pretty reasonable approximations, uh, merging the three relationships uh, reported on the left, we could obtain this trend for the bubble height as a function of pressure, from which we see that the bubble height dramatically decreases under uh, the application of pressure, leading to a great change in the aspect ratio of our system. OK, now let's have a look at the pressure evolution of Raman and photoluminescent spectra collected at the dome center. Uh, in the Raman spectrum, the first thing we notice is that uh, the intensity of the monolayer contributions dramatically decreases under pressure. This may be related to the decrease in the bubble height, which determines a progressive reduction in the interlayer distance between the bulk and the dome, making the latter progressively lose its freestanding monolayer character. Uh, regarding the peak positions, we see that the A1G peaks of both bulk and monolayer dome blue shift under pressure uh, due to the application of compressive strain, while the in-plane E1 to G peaks remain practically unaffected. This may indicate that uh, under the application of pressure, the variation in the out-of-plane strain gradients is much larger compared with the variation of the in-plane strain gradients across the monolayer dome. Uh, regarding the photoluminescence spectrum, we notice again a dramatic decrease in the intensity of the monolayer signal as a function of pressure, which can be related to the decrease in the bubble height. However, what is most interesting to notice uh, is the evolution of the A exciton energy as a function of pressure. Uh, as you can see from the figure reported over here, in the case of a planar unstrained standard monolayer, the pressure evolution of the A exciton energy follow a um, slowly increasing trend uh, with an almost constant rate. Uh, conversely, in the case of the monolayer dome, the um, variation in energy of the A exciton band is much larger and mostly is highly nonlinear. Uh, to 
explain this anomalous behavior, our idea is that uh, under the application of pressure, the variation in the complex strain gradients at work in the monolayer dome uh, determines an anomalous evolution of the electronic band structure of the system. In particular, an hypothesis is that uh, the Q and key minima in the uh, conduction band may hybridize, giving rise to an exciton band at high pressure with mixed direct indirect nature and in plane out of plane orbital character. This new exciton uh, clearly has a different nature and therefore a different pressure evolution compared with the standard A exciton of planar monolayers, which is localized exclusively in the key point of the first BUN zone. So the take home message of this case of study is that uh, in general, it is possible to couple strain components uh, with a different nature, a different origin. For example, in that case, morphological strain and external pressure to obtain a controlled tuning of the optoelectronic response of our two-dimensional samples, which is not achievable in standard conditions. And uh, with this, I have concluded. I would like to thank you very much for your attention and the organizer for giving me the opportunity of this lecture. And I'm here if you have any question. Many thanks, Elena. Are there any questions? No, nope. I don't see any questions either on Teams. So, hey, no. I have a okay. About the, the sample, the bubble sample. Yes. Uh, the production procedure is it to be grown? Uh, everything is folded. Uh, no, it's very easy. Uh, we purchase these bulk samples, uh, and then yes, and then um, you irradiate, irradiate them with protons, and the bubbles are formed. Yes. And why the 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 exciton of the bubble actually is pretty intense, but but when we apply high pressure. Uh, it, its intensity decreases because, um, probably because of that uh, hybridization mechanism that I described. Because when Q and Q extreme hybridize, um, the exciton is no longer exclusively direct, but it acquires a kind of indirect nature. Oh, sorry. The main peak is actually very symmetrical. Okay. The very first one is not. Uh, it, this one, yeah. Ah, this one. Oh, but uh, the, the scale is not the same between Raman and photoluminescence. Uh, I'm about the Ah, sorry. Uh, it's very low because uh, um, it is acquired at the dome center. And at the dome center, the monolayer is uh, strained biaxially and in plane. And so you, you see this great red shift compared with the standard condition. Thank you. are welcome. Okay. okay. Thank you very much. So no other questions for Elena, which I thank again. And now let's go Delphine. Thank you. Just a second. I will open your presentation. Which is wait. This one. This one. There you go. Delphine. Let's give it a try to see if it works. Yes. Just wait a second. Try my work. This one. Okay, I can close something. 
I can no 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 no. No. Wait a second. I guess maybe you have to make it full screen first. Yes, and then, yes. Then share it. Please. That's what I was about to do. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it's a bit complicated. Yes. At the end of the day, you're going to be fully trained. <laughs> Okay, so okay, so I do it this way. Uh, no. no, okay. Well, I can do it this no, way. No, oh, it's fine. Uh, no, no, well, it's okay. No, no, no it's not connect. It's not the correct one. Okay. Okay, let's put it this way. Yeah. All right. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Uh, thank you for logistics. Um, so, um, so hello, everyone. So my name is Delphine Lequinf. I work in ST Microelectronics. So my presentation today will be a little bit different from uh, the previous one. Uh, although we do experience uh, as well some uh, blue shift in our uh, devices, and we have also have to model those uh, to take into account this change in the band gap. So it's something that we are familiar with also. But today I'm more going to talk about metrology for process control in a high volume manufacturing environments. So it's a little bit different. So my talk today will be uh, divided into uh, those sections. So I will uh, first give a very brief introduction about ST. And the goal is not to discuss about the company, but just to give you an idea. Then we'll talk about metrology as measurement science and the strategy that we implement uh, in the manufacturing line for metrology. We'll, uh, we'll say a word about the technique that we run in metrology, although it's not fully technical. And then if I have time, uh, you will let me know, Marta, uh, we can go over some future trend that we foresee for inline metrology. All right, so ST Microelectronics. So um, probably you know uh, everyone, uh, uh, our company. So uh, it's a big uh, semiconductor manufacturer uh, company. We do also our design, so it's uh, IDM. So we cover the full um, the full process. We are about uh, 50,000 uh, employees worldwide, uh, and uh, we are growing in uh, in uh, our business. Uh, can I have a, no? Yes, we are growing. Or maybe I can use this. No. Yeah, we are growing. Uh, so we are now about 17 billion dollar revenue, and we have a plan to go even uh, further to a uh, 20 billion dollar in uh, in um, following years. Uh, we do have 14 manufacturing sites. This may be of interest for you. And now, uh, okay, we are serving a lot of uh, company and customer. So where are we located? So uh, all over the world. So if focus on um, on the front end manufacturing site, which is what uh, we call uh, manufacturing that will deal with wafer, not dyes, but wafer. This is in uh, blue color. So uh, we'll see that we are mainly located in France, Italy, Sicily, Sicilia, uh, also Sweden, where we have a, a site for silicon carbide um, substrate. It's quite recent. And also we have a site in Singapore. On the yellow uh, color, you will find uh, the location that we call the back end. This is where we dye the, the dyes and we do the molding and the, uh, and the encapsulation of the dyes and the final test. Right. So here we are more focusing on the blue uh, activity. So what do we produce? We do a lot of different techniques. The portfolio of technique of SC is really large. Uh, we do a lot of power devices, well, which is very famous for the uh, electrical car now, and the demand is growing. We are also very, very well known in uh, MEMS activities, uh, essentially in the Italian and also Singapore side for this. And we do also some communication uh, devices uh, for different variety of uh, activities with RS and mixed signal. 
Uh, we are also uh, involved in the advanced technology node. Maybe you've heard of this, that we are moving on to um, the um, FDSOI um, next node, and we're also working with uh, Doletti as a partner on this activity. Uh, in Kroll, where I come, which is close to Grenoble, uh, so um, a little bit further, 30 kilometers from here, we have a specific activity on everything related to images, uh, optical images, optical sensors. Uh, ST is doing different size of wafer. Uh, we're still running some 150 nanometer. We have uh, many sites that are running 200 millimeter uh, wafer, but we have two big factory running uh, 300 millimeter. Uh, the one in Kroll, so uh, close to Grenoble, and another one in Agrate in Italy uh, that is uh, ramping up uh, now. So those fab are known to be the most modern fab in ST. Uh, they are running all the goodies of the uh, 4.0 uh, industry. So everything is interconnected. There is not that many people in the clean room. Uh, you would be surprised, but there are still people for maintenance and troubleshooting. But apart from that, everything is automated and uh, anticipated. And it's a kind of virtual environment, uh, which is a little bit scary, but this is how, uh, how it goes. So to produce a wafer uh, coming from a, a pure uh, silicon wafer at the start till the end, it takes us, uh, depending on the technology, uh, from 6 to 12 weeks and about 600 operations. Right? So here is some uh, numbers uh, that are uh, interesting, maybe for people not familiar with the clean room. I'm not going to go over, but uh, just to, uh, some, some nice numbers is that uh, a, a wafer that we call FOOP, 24 wafer in a FOOP, will, uh, will travel about 40 kilometers on, uh, on the clean room till the, the start to the end, because it has to make different operation and, and also metrology one of the operation. So we have a lot of transistor. We have those numbers are pretty impressive. All right. So this is for ST. I guess you may find also all material in uh, in the web if if you need more information. So talking about inline metrology, uh, we need first to define some uh, uh, definition. I guess um, because this is important. So uh, metrology. Uh, is known as the measurement uh, science. So, uh, and I put this uh, sentence coming from uh, this uh, famous uh, uh, Kelvin, Lord Kelvin, uh, saying that to know, uh, to measure is to know. And if we cannot measure, we cannot improve it. I guess we can find this in different countries. But I guess in, in Japan, there is someone else also very famous saying exactly the same thing. Well, anyway, <laughs> there are many people saying this. So obviously measuring something is important. But if you look at uh, the metrology, um, if you want to, to look at it, the literature, you will find actually three types of metrology, three pillars. Uh, the first one that we call scientific metrology. So this relates to all the organi organisms that across the world are in charge to provide the more accurate uh, measurement uh, possible. So they are, there's a lot of activity there to create some instrument to be as accurate as possible. So it's really their role. So we, in France, we have the LNE, Laboratoire National d'Etalonnage, and we also have the NIST, and also in Japan, there is also a GQA. So those are people working on the scientific metrology. We have also the legal metrology. So this is related to organisms that are in charge to uh, standardize the metrology over the world so that we have the same quantity in Asia, in uh, uh, France, uh, in, uh, in the US. So uh, it's uh, some central activity. And we have uh, the industrial metrology. This is where we are at uh, today, talking about uh, how to use metrology for uh, industry, right? So still, even if we have this, this perimeter of the industry, uh, uh, we still have some uh, regulation. And uh, this is something that we have to commit to. So we have the ISO uh, 9001. And we have also the IATF. So this is a reference, uh, quality reference uh, for the automotive. So if we are doing some process and product for the automotive, in terms of quality, we need to follow the, gu the guideline given by those um, norms, actually. And in metrology, we have some very strict rules. So, and here what I'm going to explain. So first, uh, there is a, a first characteristic that we all need to, um, to look at is the accuracy. So accuracy is uh, how far we are from the true 
uh, value. The true value uh, is not always known, but at least it's known with a certain uncertainty. And we need to uh, verify that the bias that we have with the readings that we provide with metrology is not too far from the known value. So this is an activity that everyone has to run uh, if it manage a metrology uh, so, uh, system. So accuracy is one thing. Then we have precision. So precision, I, I insist on this because sometimes there is some confusion in, uh, with the French uh, precision. Precision is uh, the repeatability and the reproducibility. So how rep repeatable, repeatable we are in the readings. So nothing to do with the accuracy. It's more like we are saying always the same thing with our metrology over time, right? And we then have the stability. So stability is also a notion of repeatability, but a very larger range of time can be over weeks, months, and, and, and that kind of things. So there is a very nice uh, way to uh, look at this. I guess it's this target uh, figure that probably you know about, uh, with the center of the target being the reference value. So the closest we are from the reference value, the, the, the more accurate we are. And the repeatability precision is actually, uh, the illustration is how dispersed we are from uh, all those readings. So you'll see that here everything goes fine. Okay, we are, you know, accurate and precise. Here we are at the opposite, where we are non-accurate and non-precise because we have a large, lots of dispersion in the readings. And what we can find actually in our industry in general, in front end, is something closer to this here. So we are very precise. So our equipment uh, are always saying the same thing, for the same object, but. The, the accuracy is somewhere maybe unknown, so uh, it's something that is important, but maybe not priority compared to uh, precision. And in backend, in backend, um, in our fab or in general in microelectronics, we will find something that is not so precise but accurate. So we have diverse a diversity of uh, behavior depending on our metrology uh, system. So to, ru to run and manage accuracy, we have some uh, standards. So there is a kind of hierarchy in the quality of the standards. We, we buy, we buy some wafer that have a certificate uh, uh, with them, right? So this can be very expensive wafers, um, but we have to do this. And what we find uh, nowadays is that uh, we, the, the microelectronics industry has been growing so fast that um, the organism that are in charge to provide those standards, they did not have time to develop those uh, process method to find uh, the, uh, the best accuracy. And there is a lag of standard, especially for the small dimension. In the fab, uh, we do actually measure two entrums in our, on, on every day. We, we measure those two entrums, and I guess no one can... Uh, can tell us uh, what the true value uh, is. In two entrums, it's really small quantity. But this is really critical, especially uh, if you think that now we have uh, those all those fab being connected together. And uh, in some case, we are starting the process of one production lot here and uh, finish uh, the end in Italy or uh, in Singapore with Catania. Everything is being uh, optimize to, to load the fab to the maximum of their capacity. So we, we have to exchange wafer. And of course, we need to be aligned for the readings in metrology, right? Um, the precision, uh, we do control the precision by using actually uh, some uh, wafer that we call check standard. So those are not uh, accredited uh, standard, those just in-house wafer that we keep and that we do measure on a regular basis here. For example, here is uh, this aluminum layer that is a part of the IK metal gate for those uh, who are familiar with the CMOS, uh, which is uh, at a value of 1.2 angstroms. And you can see that over the time, it's, it's, a, it's a control chart that we have with an upper limit and a lower limit. And, and the dispersion that we have here is 0.4 which means nothing in terms of physics because it's not even the size of an atom, right? But uh, it's statistical that we are able to follow this in a production environment with all the clean room, the equipment that we have, the material that we have, and it's stable over time. Uh, one other point that we are really focusing on is not only the uh, individual stability of the equipment, but more the matching between the equipment. This is where, in general, we have the most uh, important difference between those equipment. We, we need re really them to be really aligned. So we have here about 20 angstrom oxide, and you will see that there is a little bit difference. So each color here is an, a metrology equipment with the same wafer be, being measured over time. 
with first spec, uh, upper spec, and lower spec. And you see that the difference in reading is about 0 0.1 angstroms. So we need really to control the mismatching between uh, those equipment in a very close way. So just to explain also that our business in uh, semiconductor is not a linear uh, manufacturing line as uh, you have for automotive. You know automotive, it's uh, really in general something that you see with uh, a linear uh, part moving and then you have the metrology, then the, the part goes uh, to another step and so on. And the metrology is fixed and then the metrology robot or whatever receive all the part on a, on a linear flow. In the, in the microelectronic uh, industry, everything is... Uh, all over the place and the metrology is there uh, being uh, fed while well, receiving a production uh, lot from uh, all those process tool all those chamber being uh, having to measure a large range of um, value and large uh, diversity of uh, sample actually so it's not completely the same as the automotive um, industry uh, all right, so metrology strategy for process control for the industry. Uh, so how do we implement metrology for the process control in the, the microelectronics? Well, first, as I explained, we have the metrology at the center. I put it in the center. And then we have all those processes that are being done on the wafer. I guess maybe you are familiar with this. So uh, we have cleaning, lithography, implantation, diffusion, etching, uh, dielectric deposition, CMP for planarization, PVD for metal deposition. So there is a lot to do on those uh, the specific uh, silicon wafer that uh, come to, uh, to, uh, to us till the end of the process. And in general, uh, each time there is some significant uh, uh, things being done on the wafer, there will be a control of metrology. So we are there. So um, we measure actually different types of parameters. So this is very schematic, but this is a kind of cross section of um, a wafer with obviously the transistor at the bottom here with the silicon, some epitaxial layer in general, some doping. Uh, you have the transistor with the gate, uh, source drain, and some uh, shadow trans isolation between the, the active area of uh, the device. And then we have all those interconnection, metallic interconnection with dielectric um, intermediate uh, layers for the connecting, connecting uh, the transistor here with the contact that is the first level of metal that will uh, connect with the silicon world of the transistor, let's say. And then we have the um, a pad in general to connect everything to the outside world, right? So you see that we have different type, types of measurement, feasible, critical dimension, thickness, composition, dose, uh, and stuff like that, for which we need to identify a metrology solution each time. All right, so um, we are there uh, in the line. So uh, the line is here uh, at a schematic uh, flow that we uh, like to present the thing. So we have some process equipment running something like a uh, little edge, whatever, uh, something happening on the wafer. And then we have the metrology. What, what we will do in metrology, we will measure a uh, few wafers of, uh, amount of those uh, 25 uh, lots, uh, wafer that part of the lot. And we'll uh, compare the measurement that we have on the lot with uh, a product specification at this step of the process saying if the lot is okay or not okay. If it's not okay, of course, we will stop the lot because there's something wrong going on. So we need to uh, decide something that we will do. So this is fine. This is metrology. But actually, this is not the only thing that we do with this data because we've been collected this. As we know that the slot was produced with this equipment, we are also capable to run some uh, measurements that we will uh, put on a control chart. And the control chart will actually assess the stability of the process control. So the, the metrology data is being used twice. The first one is to say go, no go for the lot, okay? And the second is to say okay or not okay for the process equipments. Of course, the control chart, uh, the delta of the control chart is smaller, tighter than uh, the, the lot uh, spec, otherwise it's, it's not gonna work. Uh, but just to explain that the metrology is used, data is used to the maximum of, uh, of the possibility. What is important to understand is that uh, what we have here as a dispersion over time, because a lot are passing, we measure a lot are passing, is uh, a variability that is observed. It's observed 
from our methodology, right? So it's a combination of both uh, the variability of the process from the process equipment, but also the variability of our methodology that is not zero because obviously we have a little bit of error. Uh, the world is not perfect. So for us, as being a methodology, the key driver is really to reduce this as much as possible so that the, uh, the sigma, the, the variance observe is the smallest as possible. And we do have an indicator because uh, the, the quality norm, the love indicator that is called the CPK. And the, the CPK is here represented. Actually, it's a, it's a ratio, let's say, of the uh, six sigma of the dispersion divided by the delta of specification. Okay, whatever, it needs to be the higher as possible so that, you know, the, the, this Gaussian that represents the variation of the, the process is, is tighter as possible so that everything that we start is equal uh, on all the technology, all the product, it's always the same value and everything is stable. This is the demand from our customer, of course, and we are challenged on this value. So the ideal world is to have this value, the CPK, at a value of 1.67. This is the automotive regulation. So it means that uh, you have to see it a, a little bit in reverse way here. But it means that there is only a few chains, actually one ppm, one part per million of chains to be out of specification. So if you have the CPK that you will analyze by statistic, and we have two links to do that for all the uh, step for which we do metrology for all the technology and all the product and everything, then you are happy because it means that there is really low chance to have an issue with uh, the automotive customer. Uh, of course, zero PPM will be better, but uh, it's tolerated to have the value of 1.67. So really everyone in the organization is trying to push uh, the process variability and the metro metrology variability to achieve this, this performance. And to do so, what we uh, we have in place is that we're using some advanced process control strategy. So back again on the flow, we have uh, the process equipment, we have the metrology, and we have the process equipment and metrology process equipment and, and back and forth. Of course, I told you that we will do uh, the product specification, the control chart and everything, but it's not all. What we will do actually is that when there is a measurement, we will actually inform the process equipment uh, that was before the, the, in the flow, that maybe uh, the thickness, let's say, of uh, the last product uh, passing through the equipment was a little bit high. So uh, the information will be fit, for, fit backward to the process equipment. So there will be a slight readjustment of the product or the product uh, process uh, setting of, of this product. So that when the uh, next lot will go through this uh, process equipment, it would be optimized and then it would be dead on the target. So it's a feedback what information for process optimization. And in the, same, in the same way, we will also provide the information to the next process equipment saying that maybe uh, this equipment needs to adapt a little bit the settings of the recipe to take into account that the previous process equipment was not exactly at the target and back and forth. So this is what we call advanced process control. So obviously it's not as simple as, as what I'm explaining here, but the methodology is here so that we are using the data coming from metrology, not only to say yes, go, no, go, okay, uh, the process, okay, but also to impact directly the process. So it's even uh, you know uh, more, more challenging, right? So this is what we call APC or run to run, it's uh, well known in the industry. We are also another um, strategy that we implement that we call uh, holistic or hybrid metrology. This time we will uh, have those uh, guys, this flow, metrology, process metrology. And in some case, we found that it's very interesting actually to provide the information from a previous uh, metrology step to a, a next metrology step. Uh, essentially, this is related to a correlation between parameters that we uh, uh, sometimes have for scattermetry recipe, ellipsometry, uh, acquisition, everything that is based on the modeling, uh, rigorous modeling. So we, we, we have implemented this by a feed forward to help the metrology after, right? So you see that metrology is still uh, used uh, not only for judgment, and if I have to say also something about metrology in the industry 4.0, we have also to not to forget that metrology is also present inside the equipment because our equipment are more and more full of sensor everywhere. 
reporting some uh, temperature information, uh, electronics, uh, plasma, whatever they have. They have many, many sensors there. So we have uh, uh, on a real time, all the time we are recording this trace uh, on the equipment uh, and we are learning essentially with some AI algorithm uh, what should be the regular uh, behavior of those uh, production equipment, try to find some something that's go on, not go in a good direction and just to stop the equipment as much as possible at the, uh, the origin of the, the issue. So this is also something that we are working on uh, very um, actively as well as creating some virtual twin um, system uh, based also on data that we are collecting on the equipment, but also on the sensor of the equipment. All right. Uh, so when 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 I'm saying this, I'm saying also that metrology is, is all over all over the place in uh, in the process and product uh, control. Of course, in uh, in a manufacturing environment, we do some design, okay, where there is no silicon. Then we move on to the development phase, where we start to do uh, silicon prototype and everything, and we have some milestone for the maturity and so on. So technology is uh, getting more and more um, uh, mature, with uh, result being uh, more and more be better and better, I would say. And then we move to production, right? Um, metrology for inline is actually present at those two steps, uh, but has different role, actually. Uh, the metrology for the R&D is uh, mostly used to provide some solution to um, increase the learning about those cycles that we do for, uh, you know, uh, uh, getting to the best condition for the technology and, and trying to find the quick pass uh, to have the performance that we have um, defined with our customer. And the metrology for manufacturing is there to control and detect deviation as uh, warn, warn everyone uh, as soon as possible. So we have, maybe I'm not going to go too much into detail because you, you, you can have this uh, later on, but we have different uh, criteria here depending on uh, is it useful for manufacturing or is it useful for development. But basically, it's not exactly the same um, driver, but it's used with the same um, group. And in general, it's the same group uh, dealing with those two, um, those two um, um, objectives. So um, what do we uh, use as a technique? For inline, this is this is interesting case. So uh, I guess we see we've seen before that we have many many uh, different um, things to measure. We have a lot of parameter. Of course, the the the, the obvious one are thickness, uh, critical dimension, uh, overlay, which is a more a little bit specific to lithography because it's the uh, misalignment between the the level uh, of the surface uh, versus the reference uh, underneath another level, or it can be also bonding because we have a lot of bonding uh, stacking uh, of a wafer now. Uh, we have the depth, we have the composition, the roughness. Uh, we, we can have photoluminescence. I forgot to add this, but we also have photoluminescence in our in our line. Uh, Raman, uh, we, it could be also there, but uh, I haven't put it. Um, and all this is actually uh, um, related to some specific technique that we put in front of them. So here we have a graph for the metrology that is in relation with the film characterization. So this is not exhaustive, right? It's uh, just a representation. In general, we are asked to measure thickness, composition, and conductivity, density as well. Um, so we have non-destructive technique by a sense because it's metrology so it's uh, nothing happened to the wafer uh, it's completely transparent so uh, obviously we use a lot of optics uh, but we also have uh, acoustic technique uh, we have also x-ray for sure ir um, ftir we have um, something that uh, is a little bit more aggressive because it's uh, touching the wafer is resistivity because it's a four point trait technique uh, we also have some uh, interferometry technique, and we also, uh, this is uh, something I like to point out, we, we do actually use also the balance. We're still, um, um, you know, measuring the weight of a wafer because uh, it can provide the very nice information about the density or the edge uh, process. So nothing is, uh, yeah, it's very simple to use, but it's still there. So all is um, what we have in thin film. And... Um, on the counterpart is the uh, metrology for patterning, where we uh, we have different technique for overlay, image based, diffraction based, critical dimension. Of course, we we use a lot the the SEM, the scanning electron microscope, but also optical microscope for larger CD, and we have topography with IFM, mechanical profilometry, scaphometry, confocal um, imaging, interferometry, and stuff like that. 
Uh, I'm not going to go over because it would take too much time to go the metrology, but maybe something that people forgot or don't know simply um, is that we actually do not measure the device itself in metrology because there is no way we can measure a device. The device is uh, about 20 nanometer for the gate uh, and we don't have any technique to measure directly in the die. It's too small in dimension. So we actually have some specific metrology target that are located in uh, what we call the uh, frame, that is the sacrificial uh, area here. This is, uh, this is the wafer. This is a little field uh, in uh, yellow here. This is one little field with a certain number of dye. So the dye are in, in uh, blue. So you have a four and four, so 16 dye. And you see that we have this crab line because at the end the wafer will be cut, right, to create the dyes. So this is sacrificial area where we could put metrology structure. We also have the secondary scrub line that, uh, uh, um, apart from the dye, that will be also dyes, so it's uh, sacrificial. We have put also some metrology structure there. And in some case, we are allowed, but it's only in some case, to put some metrology structure directly on, on, the, on the product. So it means that we have some room reserved for metrology. It's only for a few levels for which we need to a very tight control of specific uh, criteria. So all those um, here, a very nice picture, but uh, this is just design. It's, uh, it's not the images, it's just uh, purely a computer design of the structure that we will have to, um, to put uh, in advance right? because we, we need those when we, we have to measure. So we need to think about it before huh? on the mask. Uh, for example, here is typical um, uh, structure for CD measurement of VR. So it's an array of VR here. And we know that we have to measure here with the arrow there. This is overlay structure where we have, uh, you know, the shift X and Y between the center of gravity of the uh, blue and, um, and the green. So every, every technique has its own uh, specificity on the design. But this is also an activity that is uh, uh, in charge, that is um, managed by the metrology. Um, something that is some people keep asking about the difference between inline metrology and physical characterization. This happened from time to time. I, I give you my uh, my interpretation. Maybe uh, someone else has a different one. But uh, um, what we call as inline metrology is uh, in general some uh, highly automated process that is in the clean room or near the clean room, but always in the clean room. And in general, uh, the people in charge are the operation department uh, that are running the other processes and stuff like that. Physical characterization in general is uh, mostly manual process. All those things are changing a little bit, but it's still manual. And um, the uh, organization is uh, related to the failure analysis department. So we have we are sharing actually sometimes the same uh, the same technique. I could see with Narciso saying that we have X-ray technique, we have uh, things the same, we have we have some technique, but but we are not using them with the same purpose. Um, metrology actually is for sure non-destructive technique, and we need really to be uh, as small as possible for the variability because we need a tight control of icing. So uh, really, we have a big focus on our variability, the mismatching between our equipment and so on. So um, we do uh, a lot of um, process development, R&D. Uh, we are, all, of course, highly connected with the data manufacturing system. Our data are being used for process control, but they are also used for machine learning, they are also used for other, other learning that we can have. Uh, physical characterization are mostly related to destructive technique, very local information that will be used for, for modeling, but modeling of the device. We are not in this, uh, in this activity. So there are a little bit different uh, between them. The good thing is that we are complementary, I guess, and there is no, <laughs> no issue with, uh, with the two organizations. Um, uh, just a bit of uh, focus on the strain stress, uh, because this is the, the topic of challenges, right? So, of course, um, non we don't like stress uh, unless it's, it's done on purpose, because also we have some strain engineering in our uh, device to, uh, to speed up the performance. But in general, when, when people come to ask us about the technique, it's that something goes wrong somewhere and that we need to find a solution to follow and to troubleshoot the information. So what we can 
reality is that we have uh, um, a lot of new material coming in nowadays, essentially with the more and more uh, approach. Uh, with different thermal properties, different mechanical properties. We do a lot of stacking, so we do a lot of 3D integration with uh, bonding one wafer uh, on another one and even maybe triple wafers. So all this will create some stress because of the mechanic uh, difference in properties. Um, and, and what we have is that sometimes we have some wafer deformation that are awful, and this will create some little issue for the patterning because the overlay Will, will not be able, well, the overlay correction will not be able to follow the, um, the deformation that we have on the wafer. And even to the worst, it can create some crack or delamination at, uh, at some point on the wafer. So we've seen, uh, an, uh, you know, a uh, key uh, focus growing on this um, demand of uh, stress and strain. And what we have in our hand, uh, actually in line, is what is uh, here, let's say, uh, in blue. So we rely so far a lot on optical techniques. So at the wafer level, we have the deformation of the wafer that we call bow or warp. Uh, so on. We also can use some interferometry uh, technique to get information at the little level, at the dye level. But when it comes to a smaller area, um, not really the transistor, but a, a larger area, you know, 100 uh, micron square, then we can uh, move, we have to move at least to Raman or maybe XRD technique to get the information. And if we go even further to it really to the, um, the transistor itself, then we need to move to um, characterization technique and 10, uh, 10 lamella and, uh, and all the technique that goes very nice technique as well with the TEM. So we still have a, a role to, to play here. And uh, if I just want to share one thing that we had done in the past, uh, it was actually with the Letty that we did that. Um, we have this uh, this technology here where we have the, the, the gate, if I guess you, you notice the gate, and uh, from the, the, the two way around the gate, we have the silicon germanium uh, source drain. We call it raised source drain because the silicon germanium is epitaxially grown on the uh, silicon here underneath. So we have this layer and um, we wanted to have some information about the strain of the silicon germanium uh, at this level. So we created this structure because uh, we get the chance to be able to design our own structure, as I was saying, metrology. So it's uh, it's uh, it's an array okay, of uh, gates uh, on, on 1D direction. And by using some finite elements, we are also uh, able to um, define what could be the strain uh, field in this uh, one of those uh, lines here. So we have created this. And what we, what we did is that actually when we have this field, you can also predict what will be the XRD response. What? This is also something that is uh, very nice to do. So because we have XRD in line. So by using the strain field, we are able to predict what should be in the reciprocal, uh, reciprocal space map, the, uh, the pattern of the diffraction peak of the uh, this 004, I guess, of the silicon germanium. So uh, it's not only anymore a, a, a single peak because you have a periodicity here. So you will find a new periodicity in the, in the peak. So very nicely correlated as well. And, and you can use also some asymmetrical information to get a little bit of information about the relaxation. So all this is simulation. You do simulation, then you have the simulation of the XRD, and then you have this. And then you can play around simulation. You, you can change a little bit saying, well, maybe this is not exactly what is the, the reality. Let's change this, this a little bit. And then you create a big library of RSM, a big library of images, actually. And what is nice is that when you do the acquisition, so you see this is really acquisition using this equipment on this target in the funeral. Okay, so you see this is really dispersed. Okay, it's not that nice. But at least you can find the best candidate in your library that will match the, 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 the spectrum that you collect, the diagram, sorry, that you collect. And then by the reverse problem solving, well, in a sense, you end up with what should be the strain field of this uh, grating that you have. So you see that what is nice here is that you get a very local information about this stress field, strain field, uh, although you are using a very large structure and a metrology uh, information.
but it's a long road, let's say, because you have to do the simulation, the simulation, and then the measurement, and it takes a long time. All right, but just to let you know that this is this is feasible, uh, nice study, and uh, with Raman, of course, this is something uh, that I'm not going to go over everything that is, you know, everyone uh, everyone knows about Raman, uh, for silicon at least, um, but uh, um, for silicon germanium, it's also very nice to use the Raman for uh, a mapping. So this, is, so this is a silicon germanium metaxial layer that you see on top view. All right, so X and Y in a sense. And here you can have local information about the percent germanium modification uh, seeing uh, this, uh, this, uh, this layer. So it's not very uniform here in this case, but it's a direct information. And this is really something that we would like to implement because Raman is an optical technique, easy to, uh, to have, fast throughput. Uh, for us, it's the best candidate to, to be in line, although uh, it's not uh, there yet, but um, it's, it's a good candidate. Uh, just to finish, I guess we also uh, can have some information about the stress strain at the wafer level. So here it's uh, before deposition of a film and after deposition, you can do the subtraction and get the information about the influence of the deposition of your film on the deformation of your wafer, but at the local uh, the local uh, space uh, frequency this time. And uh, you can have very nice picture uh, about the wafer and you know very well what is actually, uh, you know, what is being stressed, which part or at least of the device is being stressed by who and to what uh, dimension and, uh, and so on. So this is very, very nice also uh, information about stress and strain. Okay, this is, this is, I guess, all I have. I don't know if the time is, uh, I guess, yeah, it was a bit, but okay, then I will stop. Uh, and I will, uh, I will stop this, I guess. And I will thank you for your time and uh, appreciate if you have any questions. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So are there any questions? Yes. Curiosity, the, uh, managing heat wafers, so passing from 6 inches wafer to 12 inches mm -hmm. wafer, did it add an effect on the strain? Yes, 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 yes. Yeah, for sure. We have uh, we have to model this. Uh, yes, because uh, obviously uh, the size is important. So we uh, and essentially we have also some equipment, especially for dielectric layer that you know nitride, those kind of things that will create some high stress. So we had to adapt. Uh, the film and the thickness to uh, to have something flat. What we do a lot as well, maybe something important for you is that um, with all those processes that getting more and more complex, we uh, end up sometimes with a wafer with a high bow, uh, you know, the, the wafer. And this is a problem because of uh, we cannot load the wafer in our equipment, so so there is some issue of breakage and something like that. So what we do actually is that we put on the backside intentionally some dielectric layer to uh, to uh, put the wafer back as a flat wafer so we add some uh, some uh, on purpose we add some uh, deposition to get uh, a flat wafer so what happens when you find out somewhere in the truss it's, it went wrong and it has to go out do you just throw the wafer or do you clean it up and start over um uh, well at this uh, okay we have multiple uh, metrology so i guess are you talking about the end of the line or uh, no and in general in general when this happens um let's say it's out of specification in some case uh there are some process for which we can actually work but like Lito, for example, we take off the resist and start again. Uh, some of some other are more difficult, but in general, there is a risk assessment that is being done. But if the um, if the parameter for which it's out of spec, spec is critical, that there is an issue for the device, is going to be scrapped yeah. directly. 
And even some parameter, the worst is not really the, the spec, but the reliability. This is really something that we don't want our customer to face some issue with reliability. So in case of uh, concern about is it going to, maybe it's going to work, but is it going to work 10 years as we, we uh, you know, we, 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 we said that we will do it, so uh, this will take off. So we have a special committee with board uh, from different organizations for the decision every day. Every day. Okay. No problem. No other questions? No problem. Okay, great. Thank you, Delphine. So, Roberto, it's up to you. Mm, let me just. No. Yes. Uh, okay. Second. No. Okay, thank you. I try to be on time with my presentation. I will speak for uh, about um, a specific uh, method for strain analysis in crystals based on TM. Okay, based on TM, so uh, quite quite specific and definitely not an inline technique. <laughs> okay, for sure. Uh, uh, this is just to say that I will base on my my talk mainly on these two references. They are a bit old references, but I think I, they are still quite uh, actual since they describe that the most important uh, uh, most important aspect of a TM analysis or strain. I think you can know you know these guys. They they come from a specific site called Leti and CI. I don't know if you are familiar <laughs> with <laughs> even Grenoble. So just to say, there is a long tradition here in electromicroscopy, and there are guys with the uh, uh, from Jean Luc and other people that have uh, a strong experience in this field. Of course. So um, you already uh, learned something about the definition of strain. What we one, what is strain? What, what we, we mean when speaking of strain? Uh, the first thing I want to point out is that we are speaking of strain in crystal, in bulk crystal, in 3D crystals. And uh, the definition has already been done is, is the, 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 the response of, of materials that are crystalline structure to an, extra, uh, an external field. We call uh, uh, stress is generally defined by a tensor in free space, 3D space. And uh, um, while for um, non crystalline material, we can define, um, sorry, this is a pointer. Or... Okay, but the, the first formula uh, strain and, uh, and stress can be related by the, the, the young modulus, which is essentially the slope of. Uh, of this curve that relates strain with, with stress in a in a, in a say in a homogeneous material, but when we speak about uh, on, uh, thank you. Okay, fine. Thank you, Vittorio. And but when we speak uh, um, about crystals, uh, uh, strain is as well a tensor as uh, a stress, and the relation is no more. Uh, in general, no more uh, a constant, but is uh, a complex uh, tensor. Uh, in general, four order tensor. And then we can play with the symmetries of the crystal and can reduce uh, all, all uh, the complexity of this uh, uh, stiffness uh, constant, uh, the compliance is constant. But again, strain is uh, uh, a symmetrical three times three tensor. And if you if we deal with small so elastic deformation that can uh, 
that means that the, the, the original situation in a crystal can be recovered if we uh, uh, stop the, the action of the external stress. And we can write down the, the, the string components and, the, and the, in the di in diagonal component and the shear string component. Diagonal components are the, 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 the variation of the crystal lattice uh, along the principal, the main direction of our reference, while the shear string component uh, are the the let's call the one that they, the form to say that the crystal structure of the material. Just to uh, go on, let's start with uh, 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 an already used, uh, shown examples. The the best the best material we can play with when we speaking about strain in and in, in, in crystals. Uh, this is the growth of a silicon germanium alloy uh, over a, a silicon substrate. Uh, we are dealing with two different materials, perfect silicon, which has its own, they have the same structure with different lattice parameters. We know that silicon germanium has a larger lattice parameter due to the fact that germanium has a covalent radius larger than silicon. So uh, they have different lattice parameters. We call this the misfit between the two, the, the, the two structures. And what happens when we try to match these two structures Let's say when we in general grow a silicon germanium alloy over a, a silicon substrate, either we can relax stress, strain, stress by uh, introducing this location, but this is usually an unwanted thing, in, especially in microelectronic industry, or if you don't, we don't have a plastic deformation, so the, the introduction, if you are, we have a, a dislocated free materials, there is a residual strain coming from the adapting, from adapting the silicon germanium to the crystal, uh, the, sorry, to the silicon substrate. And this distorted region uh, from simple uh, geometric consideration, you can find out that since the silicon substrate is infinite and also the interface is infinite, the only free surface for relaxing the strain is the, the growth surface. And so you can find out that the only part from between silicon and silicon germanium that can account for the strain is the silicon germanium film, which is limited. So what happens is that in a, along the plane interface, the lattice parameters is the same with silicon, but you have a tetragonal, the so-called tetragonal distortion. The cube is distorted along the growth direction. That end up, ends up with a situation like this. The silicon germanium lattice parameter along the growth direction is enlarged with respect to the unstrained structure. So this is the same thing. Uh, what happens in addition to this when we uh, we deal with the pattern structure. So the film is not continuous, but the, there's a patterning for uh, building a device, something like that. Now we are introducing a, a, an additional free surface and the crystal, germanium crystal, try to relax the strain along this direction. The, the is free in this zone, more tied to the silicon. But the, the final situation is that we we'll, may, may found uh, a large strain, log, a large logal strain in the in this position. Okay, this can may happen. This is a very old picture from Nestia Graph that I work with, <laughs> collaborate with with a, a CMOS, I think, in one megabyte, <laughs> very old one. But we we started studying stress and strain in, in this kind of structures in the substrates. Uh, and this is the situation in which uh, TM analysis can may be useful also uh, in, in collaboration with people performing simul stress sim strain simulation for uh, trying to, to, to find out what the, the strain is in materials. So why using TM? Oh, the advantage in, in a, any application of TM is, is, uh, is it's high spatial resolution, of course. Uh, so spatial resolution that can be, uh, be as low as uh, less than one nanometer for strain analysis, but uh, you know that in imaging nowadays we are going 
less than one angstrom. But we always we all know what are the disadvantages of using a TM. So uh, TEM facilities are uh, not easy to assess. TEM, te TM techniques are time consuming and destructive in sample preparation. And we are in the, in the end trying to measure a quantity strain in a uh, deformed materials, in a thin layer, in a thin lamella. And probably the, there is, we must take into account the possibility that strain is relaxed in our <coughs> final measurement. Okay, uh, this is an old microscope, the old one, this one we, use, we are still using in Bologna, we're trying to, <laughs> and this is a new one, uh, one term official, one from GEO, just uh, to, <laughs> to balance <laughs> the competition between the two manufacturers. This is a, a new one, a corrected one, with uh, sub angstrom spatial resolution. Uh, we'll skip this uh, description because uh, Vittorio Morandi tomorrow Promise that we give you a, a thorough introduction to TM analysis. Uh, for people with, who are not familiar with TM, it's, it's important just to know that we have an electron gun, a source uh, of, for electrons that are accelerated, given voltage. We have, we have a set of lenses by means of which we can shape the electron beam onto the sample. The sample is put like this in the middle of the column and the uh, just in between the objective lens, which is the most, imp more important, most important lens in the microscope, then we have uh, imaging lenses in a conventional microscope, then we have at the end uh, generally a camera to collect a final image. This is uh, the basic schema of a, a TM. Nowadays, TM, modern TMs have uh, tens of lenses just to correct aboration. So here we have, let's say, seven or eight lenses in motor microscope we can, can end up up to 20 lenses just to correct the aberration and, and improve the, the performances of TM. Uh, another thing we have must take into account when speaking about TM analysis is that we are not dealing with particles. Electrons are uh, truly quantum mechanical entities. And so what we, when we speak of electron analysis, we must think of an electric electron wave, maybe a planar wave, that is interacting with our object. And we must keep into mind, always keep in mind that uh, uh, the relation with the, uh, a probe, which is a, is a wave and an object depends on the, the final result would depend on the ratio between the incoming particle or uh, radiation wavelength and the dimension of the final object. TM as a resolution, TM at high resolution, one of the May, most important thing to keep in mind is that the wavelength associated with TM is of the order of a few picometers, which, which are much smaller than the atom dimension. So electrons are able to see the distribution of the potential in, inside each atom, can see the, the potential of the nucleus and the potential associated with the electronic cloud. And if you play with the TM, we, we always uh, are reminded about this, we also remind by this because when you switch on to diffraction analysis, we see a diffraction by electrons. And this is due to the fact that electrons interact with the sample as waves. So you can get diffraction. From our point of view, this is a simple geometrical optic system. We have uh, the sample, a plane wave impinging out of the sample, there is a scattering of electrons, there is a, a lens, the objective lens, this is the most important lens in our microscope that generates a diffraction pattern in the in the focal in, in focal plane of the lens and an image in the image plane of the lens and that's all then we have an illuminating system then we have an imaging system but that's the heart of the our microscope and in performing analysis and i divided this presentation on diffraction based techniques and image let's say uh, image based techniques uh, depends on if we perform the analysis at this level in the diffraction pattern or at this level in the final image pattern, final image, let's say. <coughs> Simply, the TM can operate in, in these two modes, sample, first lens, focal plane, first image, 
first image plane. Then by switching in, uh, uh, and uh, exciting in a different way the, the other lenses, we can obtain in the final screen an enlarged image or an enlarged diffraction path. That's all we need to know. An important thing to keep in mind, take account of, uh, is sample preparation. We can perform different without going into details. These are conventional preparation by grinding, thinning mechanically and by ion beam. But nowadays we are, this is most uh, used method, extraction of lamella, TM lamella by FIB. Uh, we need thin samples in a TM because electrons interact strongly with matter. So sample of the order of 100 nanometer. And speaking of such a thin lamella, strain relaxation can be an important factor that, that in some times can uh, prevent you from any measurement of strain. And uh, this is a, a schematic representation of the cross-section of a TM lamella. This is the electron beam that crosses our samples. And if you, if you are in a strained situation, let's say close to the surface, you may find out that Performing analysis in a thick lamella or in a thin lamella can lead to different results. We can think in a very rough scheme that our sample can behave differently depending on the general amount of strain that it, it carries and as a function of the local thickness. A uh, very thick sample with very low strain, uh, strain will uh, relax at the three surfaces. So at the upper surface and the lower surface. And the amount of uh, relaxed thickness, yes, just qualitatively, is a given uh, uh, portion of the sample. If you have a low strain in a large lamella, probably this, con this region will contribute to the final analysis just as a, a noise background. But you, what you are looking at is a, is a bulk situation. But if you are measuring thin lamellas and the large strain, probably you are end up in regions like this in which either your uh, analysis cannot be performed or if it is performed, uh, can lead to wrong results. Always keep in mind this, and we'll come to this at the end of my, of my presentation. So diffraction. You will get diffraction from a crystal in a TM because crystal has an order structure of atoms, of scattering sources. Since their uh, position in space atoms in the crystal is, is uh, regular, their Scat the scatter intensity in the reciprocal space, that is the diffraction pattern, is regular as well. And in a diffraction pattern, you may associate each diffracting point to the set of planes. So you can say that in silicon, uh, this is a transmitted beam, this is a diffracted beam, and you can associate this beam to, with a set of planes, and another beam with another set of planes. In a diffraction pattern, the distance of the spots from the transmitted beam is proportional to the scattering angle. And from the Bragg law, you know that the closer uh, planes in real space will give rise to large scattering angles in reciprocal space. And that's all. If you have a variation in the distance between planes, you will end up with a variation in the distance of the scat. On the, of the spot in diffraction. So by measuring diffraction, you have information on the, on the, uh, uh, on the strain in the material. That's the general principle. And if you are familiar with X-rays, you can write the same expression in reciprocal space, which is a set of points, each one associated with the set of plane distances in real space. And you will find out that the key vector and the scattered vector of electrons. This is the uh, incident vector plane in the, in the, uh, onto the specimen by electron. And this is the scatterer one. 
elastic scattering me means that the energy of the scattered uh, electrons are the same of the incident one. So these two, uh, two tips lies on the sphere. Since the wavelength of electrons is one is of the order of a few picometers, this sphere is quite large because k, which is proportional to a reciprocal of the wavelength, is large. And so the uh, the able sphere intersects the position of the uh, of the of the lattice point at at the very zero order lower zone, and that's why in a single diffraction pattern we can we are able to see so many diffracting spots. So we are looking in just one diffraction pattern at all these scattering spots in a plane. This means also that conventional diffraction can give you only two, -d -dimens two dimensional information on the crystal. It is a projection of the crystal. No information on the direction, on the strain of any quantities on, along the direction of the beam can be extracted from a conventional diffraction pattern. But we see that it's possible in, in some cases. So in conventional electron diffraction, we illuminate a sample with a parallel beam, just one K vector, impinging vector, we obtain a diffraction pattern. We will see this case later when we use a convergent beam. And the problem in like this is in, in a situation like this is that if you are not able to reduce the size of your, your beam, you may end up in analyzing different regions. So you have a, uh, and this differently oriented region, and this can be a, a, a problem in, in diffraction analysis because you don't have a unique solution. You may, your final uh, uh, diffraction pattern may be blurred. Uh, how can we solve this? By the so called nano beam diffraction. Trying to keep the uh, illumination as small as possible. And this uh, cannot be obtained in, uh, let's say, conventional old TM microscope. You need a, a sophisticated illuminating system, which is now available in modern microscope in a three lens system. And now it's, it's possible to have uh, probes of the order of, let's say, few nanometers. So investigate a very region of space in, we can, in which we can have, uh, let's say, an homogeneous uh, strain configuration. And then simply uh, analyze this uh, this pattern. Try to compare uh, 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 the pattern obtained in a, a strain region compared with the one obtained in a reference region. That's what we usually do. And by using simply the Bragg law, try to find what is the the the, the strain acting. Uh, what are um, the advantages and disadvantages. Uh, the advantages is that it's very simple interpretation, very straightforward. If your machine is well well aligned, if you know how to operate with your your microscope, you can obtain very easily this kind of of, of diffraction pattern. Uh, there are some problems, never, however. Uh, let's say already said in homogeneities in the samples. If you have a large strain gradients in space you should you illuminate different region with different strain you had you end up all this region in the final pattern and that could lead to uh wrong results some sometimes uh the probe possible problem are related to the evaluating this the true spot position the spot is not a point as a, a finite dimension uh, several factors we are going not going into, uh, mainly uh, governed by dynamical scattering or sometimes by uh, strain relaxation inside the same volume, can make the uh, intensity inside a single spot not even. It's not a flat intensity. Maybe can have a peak and something like that. How can you treat this position? How, if you find this kind of uh, uh, inhomogeneous inside the spot you are measuring, what are you doing? What, what you 
what is the true position? You mean the average position, the center of gravity, or the peak? Different interpretation that could lead a different to different results. But never, uh, nevertheless, just to in um, just to summarize the, the, the characteristic of this method, you need uh, a modern microscope in, in, uh, as a, as the final uh, uh, advice. Let's say. Uh, a good camera with a large digital camera. Now 2K, 2K is quite common, but 4K to 4K in order to have the, as much resolution as possible in the in determining the, the 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 illumination, the pixel for determining the the, the shape, the, the intensity shape of each spot, and try to have an homogeneous crystal sample thickness, just to avoid uh, uh, dynamical scattering effect. We'll come to this later. Uh, no, now, what is dynamical scattering? Dynamical scattering uh, comes from into thick, relatively thick samples because of multiple scattering of electrons inside your atoms. It means that if your ele incoming electrons interact just once with your sample because before exiting, the interpretation is straightforward. At the, it may happen that one electron scattered can be scattered again and again inside the same sample. And then the interpretation much, can be much and much difficult. Uh, this is a, a simulation of diffraction pattern in silicon at uh, two angstrom some thickness, 3.6 nanometer, 10 nanometer and so on. You will see that the distribution intensity in the spots vary because now the, the, sample, the electrons are scattered back and forth between these reflections. And the final image could be, could be different as well. Uh, this is the meaning. This is what is called the uh, kinematical scattering. This is what is called dynamical scattering. In terms of the interpretation of the true position of your spot, diffracted spot in the diffraction pattern. This can be extremely important because if you have a, a slight misorientation of the sample in a dynamical uh, scattering configuration, this is the, the, the shape of a diffracted spot as a function of the local thickness and as a function of a slight misorientation of the sample. You see that the, this is the kinematical case, so, so the, is a single scattering. If you are well aligned, it means that the position of the spot doesn't vary with the thickness. But in case of a dynamical scattering, this is a simple simulation, what happens? You see that the position of the spot is centered after for a given thickness, but when the thickness increases, the spot may be go this way or that way becomes dark and then again bright and then dark. This means that the position of your spot actually, the maximum of the intensity of your spot can change the position in your measurement if you are affected by dynamical uh, scattering. Is there a way to solve this? Yes. You need to uh, spend uh, some money, let's say about 200 kilo euros. I'm right. 300, okay, <laughs> nowadays, just to improve the illuminating system of your, of your microscope. That means that the, the direction of incoming electron is no more along the axis, but is doing something like this, which is called precession. That means that it impinges on, the, on a given zone axis by performing a precession about the axis. That means that all strongly scattering planes, that means planes that are a, a strong scattering potential for electrons, are now less excited. And so what happens is that the, uh, without precession, you, you find that this is a, 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 a you, I show you before the simulation of a diffracting pattern, these are actual experimental values without precession, with, and and uh, with a, a larger, larger angle of precession, you will find out that this, now the, the 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 illumination distribution among the spots is more 
more kinematical. So the interpretation of the position of the center of gravity of each spot is more reliable. And this is another example with precession up, precession one degree, precession three degrees, and so on. So uh, I don't speak <laughs> about this. Uh, I will show at the end the table uh, just uh, um, just uh, uh, trying to compare all the techniques I'm going to show you. This is another traditional technique uh, that it was quite successful until 15 years ago, but now uh, uh, has actually lost is important, especially from for the analysis of uh, samples in microelectronic industry because of, of, of the spatial resolution is now required. Now, the convergent beam technique. This is a, a parallel illumination and diffraction pattern made of spots. If you made the beam to converge into one point, you increase the spatial resolution because you can obtain in a conventional microscope a beam size of one nanometer quite easily. And your final diffraction image is something like this because a diffraction pattern is a plot of the intensity scattered by your sample. So a position in this pattern means angles okay so if you uh, have um, an interval of angles impinging on your samples this is a this point becomes spheres circles because for each point you have different angles of exiting electrons what does it mean that in the reciprocal space it means that we don't have a single evil sphere we have but we have multiple evil sphere and now we are able to uh, analyze reciprocal lattice points of high order lower zone so uh, convergent beam is the only technique in uh, in the in diffracting technique in the tm that is able to explore the third dimension of reciprocal lattice because uh, now we have a cone incident uh, radiation and all the electrons belong to that plane marine black condition that means that in the central beam you will have bright spots instead of the region in which the electrons are scattered and you will find that here there are dark lines deficiency line if you enlarge the central beam the, the transmitter beam spot you will find these lines that corresponds to electrons that has been scattered to high order lower zones. This is high angle scattering, that means high sensitivity to strain. And by measuring the position of this line, you can easily detect strain. This is silicon measured in one zero zero one, and this is silicon germanium measuring by the same uh, in the same uh, orientation. This means that the germanium stretches along the beam direction so in conventional diffraction you can detect this by since this line comes from high order lower zone you can detect a variation strain in the third dimension you can easily detect the loss of symmetry just to in few words to conclude we measure a diffraction a conversion beam diffraction pattern in perfect silicon then we go to the strain region we measure the same pattern find uh, uh, how the position of this line changes and we can reconstruct the whole strain tensor in principle and this is an application to strain silicon with the position of silicon nitride and you can find that we can reproduce quite well the what is was foreseen in the uh, strain in the in the growth direction shear strain so quite effective what are the limitations of this technique? Uh, if you have a strain variation along the, the beam, you will see as if there is different orientation of materials and this blur out completely your pattern. It's impossible to measure by bed if you have some strain variation inside your beam. If you have a strong gradient, they see close to, the, to an edge, when you have a high strain, the the convergent beam pattern complete completely blurs out so the field of application 
has very, very limited to the, in general structure in which you uh, have uh, the, um, let's say, the strain that uh, is can be homogeneous over some tens of a nanometer. It's difficult. We apply this, this technique to analyze uh, um, STR devices, let's say, but when the devices, the size of the devices went below 60 nanometer, 40 nanometer, okay, the bed <laughs> was, was completely inapplicable. But if you have a, a much larger structure, you can do it. Nevertheless, in the past, we were able just to perform automated measurements and uh, extract strain map, but in large structures. Let's see. Quickly on the in uh, image-based technique, uh, not really all interferometric technique, inter interferometric techniques. Although the method of analysis are almost the same. Uh, if you, I don't know if you are familiar with holography, not with uh, Star Wars, of course. <laughs> what what is an hologram? Uh, an hologram is uh, uh, let's say. Hologram means uh, total recording, holography. Uh, it means that we are not collecting only the amplitude of, uh, of a generated image, but also in some way the phase, which is carried by the, the scattered light, electrons, whatever. This is a scheme of, uh, of an image, classic image formation. You have an object, uh, an illuminating system, and the radiation emitted in some way by a, an optical system, let's say a lens or a geoprojecting system or TM or whatever, produces the final image. And what do you recall that the final in the final image is essentially in intensity, which is proportional to the uh, to the uh, to the square of the uh, of the modules uh, of the of the wave. Of the wave, so you completely lose in this uh, uh, in, in this in this case the phase that is carried by the, the scatter wave. But in in holography, what is done is keeping the the, the first uh, illuminating system, but it, the final image will be the interference of the scatter image, the scatter light or whatever or scatter radiation, uh, which it interferes with a reference one. And so the, the final image will be uh, the, the square amplitude of the sum of the two images, which, uh, which uh, uh, ends up with the sum of the amplitudes as a term which strongly depends on the phase of the phase difference between the scattered image and the reference one. How can it be used? Let's suppose in a, Let's say in this case, in a microscope, we have a reference beam that uh, goes through vacuum and, uh, and another beam that interferes with an object. If this is a pure phase object, that means there is no absorption of uh, no, uh, no strong scattering of this, but only this object acts only on the phase of the incoming, uh, on the coming radiation. You will find out that by making these two beams interfere to obtain the final image, you see a modulation of the uh, interference pattern resulting. Uh, what do we do in this case? We do a Fourier analysis of the, this pattern. We can extract, we can represent it in a frequency spectrum. I'm not able to see clearly. In a frequency spectrum, we can play a little with this since we, we are interested in phase i hope I, i'm not able to see from here but okay we can get rid we can filter this uh, diffraction part to get rid from the amplitude uh, part and just take the phase which is we can find in, in the scattered intensity so by reconstructing by the inverse fourier transform procedure you can uh, have a flat amplitude because we cancel it and the phase image in which the intensity is proportional to the local thickness of, of our sphere, of course. So we, we reconstruct, we have a non-absorbing uh, uh, element. Electron passes through the, our object. Only the phase is, uh, is, uh, is changed in the incoming radiation, and the phase is proportional to the local thickness, and the final image is 
proportional to the local thickness of our object. So, uh, in a similar way, although this is not holography, we can uh, do the so-called uh, geometric phase analysis. Essentially, is a method that uh, in which we analyze our sample by uh, um, recording uh, high-resolution images, so recording the image position of our sample. Uh, we can, um, okay, that we can go much uh, quick in the, uh, we can the, decompose all the frequencies of our sample in, in a diffraction pattern by elementary fringes and they combine them to obtain the final image. What is done here is collect a, a resolution image, go to the, diff, extract a diffraction, uh, a, a, Fourier a Fourier analysis of the high resolution images. So this is a Fourier the Fourier transform of the image. And since the image as uh, I resolute contains the position of the atoms that are regular uh, arrangement in the image, there are frequencies that correspond to the lattice plane of the atoms. And these are reported in the, in the diffraction pattern. You see here an enlargement of this interface from uh, I see, I see silicon and silicon germanium. And if you enlarge the spots here, you'll find that it is composed by two spots, one corresponding to the silicon lattice and the other one to the silicon germanium. By performing the same Fourier analysis, by uh, filtering the, the pattern, we can obtain, uh, by inverse Fourier transforming, a phase analysis of, of these materials by taking the silicon as a reference. This is how the phases the position of the, of the germanium, silicon germanium atom, different from, periodically differ from the uh, silicon reference with the distance. So it is a method to, to detect what is the lattice parameter of, of the silicon germanium. If you take one uh, lattice spot and then a different one, that we are calling G, this spot, this one and this one, you can combine them to extract a 2D strain map of your materials. So if you are able to collect high resolution images of the reference crystal and the strain crystal, you can use this method to extract a st the strain arrangement in your material. Okay, this is just a, a map representation of strain along X and Y and the shear strain, but this is comes straight, this is straightforward. So uh, this is from the paper I mentioned at the beginning of my talk. Uh, this is a, a, a sample composed of a multi-layer of silicon and silicon germanium alloy. And this is an image uh, in which this method is applied to, to extract the, the strain in the material. OK, quick to the uh, final example very fascinating one. This is true holography in the TM. We can do the same things with the uh, with the holography, uh, trying to do the same analysis in, in, in our materials, which is composed by uh, lattices, undeformed lattices and deformed lattice. The variation in the in the uh, in the strain, so in the lattice position, which means a variation in the phase, and can so you can you use the property of holography to detect this. The only thing we have to do is now not looking at your at our sample in this position by tilting the beam, not the sample. This is not a good example. So by tilting the beam, so putting in axis the transmit the, the diffracted beam of our uh, sample. This is a quite more clear situation. This is a conventional off-axis holography. Uh, you illuminate uh, uh, our sample. There is a hole close to the, when you thin the sample, you can easily obtain a hole in which the, the electron can pass through and other electron can pass through the, the object, then a biprism deviate the two electrons, making them interfere in the final hologram. 
in bright field of axis holography, you can we can position the sample so that here we have the reference material, let's say the sub silicon substrate in our case, and here the silicon germanium strain material, and make interfere the two the two um, the two waves. But this is not you can obtain any shift like this because you are collect in this situation you are collecting dark beam that carry only amplitude we need a transmit a diffracted beam to carry to reveal the phase so we need to tilt our illumination just to put the transmitted the diffracted beam on axis and do it perform the same analysis by doing this it's possible to place a biprism like this the region here is uh, the reference silicon region the upper region we are going in a local structure local oxide is this is silicon this is oxides silicon oxide and so on and this is the strain region this is the fringes arises from the holography and by performing the analysis we did before Fourier transform filtering and the and um, inverse Fourier uh, transform you can get you can end up with the map of the phase variation due to strain in our material and then by using different uh, reflection perform a strain map of our material again what very fascinating technique but you can do it in almost any microscope but you need an uh, electron biprism. You need some experience to operate with this kind. Of, so <laughs> you need to be quite training. Uh, it's advisable, advisable that your uh, microscope could carry a Lorentz lens that can go, uh, work in place of the objective lens. So it, it could, should be designed for this uh, analysis. Again, thickness here play another is a detrimental role you need relatively thin sample to perform this kind of analysis and in thin samples we are prone to strain relaxation you must keep in mind this so close to the end this is a, a um, you can read this at home <laughs> uh, Take your time to try to uh, to compare different techniques. Uh, in my opinion, the precession, electron diffraction, nanobeam diffraction, is the most versatile one. So, is the the one that can offer you the best performances in all field of application. But even nanobeam diffraction to avoid uh, dynamical effect needs not so thick samples. This is a, a challenge school, so uh, it's worth mentioning uh, an example coming from challenges work. These are the silicon germanium sample provided by Nevin. Uh, this uh, as description this is uh, the the the, the, con the germanium content of of uh, silicon germanium layer on silicon and the thickness we try to analyze with three different techniques convergent beam diffraction pattern it failed completely we are not able to to see any lines here uh, geometric phase analysis analysis in, in higher resolution and nano beam diffraction but or even selected area diffraction just try to keep our beam as small as possible in our conventional and 20 years old microscope you see that it's poss clearly possible to see here two spots so you can perform the the analysis we did before and extract the strain and what are the results this is the nominal germanium content this uh by converger being not applicable by diffraction 1.2, 1.8, 2.3, and by GPA, that is analysis in high resolution in thin samples, 0 0.5, 0 0.6, 1.8.
much and much slower because analysis in diffraction mode this in, was performed in sample four nanometer thick. Analysis by GPA was in a sample 100 nanometer thick. At 200 nanometer, in our micro in our microscope is not our micros is not able to to detect to record good high resolution image. So we we have to keep thin. Uh, we have the the thickness uh, low the thickness of our sample. Uh, Okay, the first candidate for this discrepancy is strain relaxation, in my opinion, but we wanted to check it. We perform also microanalysis and the, the result was quite good because 20 and 21 by ADX, 30 and 34 by ADX, 40 and 40 by ADX, so was not bad. This is again the uh, mismatches measured by select direct diffraction. By since you are by imposing that your germanium is completely substitutional you can by calculation with elastic lattice with elastic elastic constants you can evaluate the misfit and so try to extract by uh the vega low the this MOOC variation the vega low the uh, the uh germanium concentration corresponding to this strain measurement and in case of the first sample we obtain 15 percent compared to 20 percent but in this sample 28 against 30 36 against 40 so it's not too bad in my opinion in this case uh, less than a half so you can use whatever technique you want. Some are better, but sample preparation is the ultimate limit, of course. You can end up uh, with strain relaxation that completely uh, uh, lower the uh, the accuracy of your of your measurement. Uh, this is a what we saw before, you can have strain relaxation. This situation in which you have a cap, you have a substrate, a strain region, and then again, uh, are much more favorable to, to strain analysis. But in conclusion, okay, in conclusion, uh, you must keep in mind that sample geometry, the strain distribution, the effects of sample preparation, and the strain relaxation to, due to sample thinning has a fundamental role in this kind of analysis. So uh, you can use the final uh, message is that you can use uh, even the best, uh, the best uh, technique, the best technique possible to analyze this, but it can be perfect, perfect uh, uh, technique in a given same kind of sample, but can lead you were bad result in other one you have to know what are you managing actually so that's the end of my talk thank you uh, we have one question from on the chat yeah which kind of software do you usually do you usually use to obtain information about diffraction pattern to perform simulation or to analyze holography application? <laughs> okay, there are uh, many of them. I don't know. I'm not. Uh, okay, for uh, the. Um, there are many. You find um, in many routines for uh, electron microscopy, starting from uh, gems, from. Um, I don't know. The, the gems uh, software or there are free softwares uh, running on uh, different uh, I, I, I don't remember the, the specific name of the yes the no, image okay yes it's major gems is a routine you can buy from pierre stadelman that uh, developed uh, you can use routine from image that are uh, freely available uh, because extracting uh, 
uh, information from a diffraction pattern is uh, quite simple once you know the, the laws of diffraction, so you can do it by hand or using, uh, there are many software on the market. Uh, more specifically, I think for um, image J, there are software also for uh, analysis of holography, I think for, for yes, there is one, oh, Holo J, which is, uh, a package available for um, from for gem for um, image a let's say so you can find free uh, software on the market uh i don't know if anybody is interested in performing converge beam uh, analysis we, we we built our own software here there are some of this available too so uh, the choice is quite uh, is quite large uh, there are there are little you, you need to practice with any software you might want to use because uh, there are not uh, usually are software developed by uh, by researchers but by developers that are not always a, a clear interface that uh, yeah. As you know, we are working a lot on this technique, and I want just to comment regarding holography. In fact, another problem, I don't know if you talk about this, but another problem with holography or strain is that you need to have a region of ref, a reference region. Yeah. And when you are working with, for example, with the SOI, mm. it will be a miscarriage. Yes. And then it is the problem. Yeah. So this is why, at least at late now, we mostly use uh, a nano beam precession electron diffraction. Yes. Yes. Or nano beam precession electron diffraction, I think, is the. the yes. Yes, is the ultimate analysis. I, I agree with you. I agree with you. I, I also tried to uh, perform an. Uh, I, I worked a lot in the past with converged beam electron diffraction, uh, and I tried to apply in many materials. In, and uh, I found also that the, in SGI structures, it was impossible, always impossible, because it was really impossible. You, you, find, you also have a slight misorientation, something like that. You have to recover this, and, uh, and for this, uh, for a... Uh, holography you need the purpose and what, what i didn't mention uh, is that in uh, using electron holography you need uh, an homogeneous thickness yes. in, in all the analyzed region and this is quite difficult to reach even with with fib preparation yes. you have to take into account of this otherwise you can get uh, really wrong results yes. you know Uh, we have one question that arrived late for Delphine. So <laughs> <laughs> I can answer for Delphine, of course. <laughs> okay, here, then I'll uh, yeah. Could you please explain the time required for Raman mapping with inline measurements? So, again, for the time the time required for Raman mapping with inline measurements. Uh, I guess this this. Uh, maybe this is in reference with what I presented. Uh, <laughs> Um, uh, it was actually it was not inline ramen, but uh, it was offline ramen. But I guess it was pretty long, so um, um, I would say at least uh, two or no, two or three hours, something like that. As well, it was very long uh, measurement, that's for sure. Uh, but but it was a, a specific uh, test that we did to uh, with a very dense mapping to have uh, you know uh, Raman spot size is about one micron so it was I guess maybe uh, 100 micron by 100 micron let's say something like that so uh, let's say yeah a couple of hours it's not something that we would consider as as a, a control in line it's more for characterization and, and troubleshooting I don't know if this is <laughs> so since we are a bit late we will have like a 10 minute break yeah 10 minutes 15 like that
let's say 15, let's resume at half past, uh, half past, half past five, sorry. Uh, so uh, we are from CLAT and uh, for my part I'm working on the nano characterization platform so Nash is all told about that uh, at the beginning of the afternoon and Jerome is working in the clean room where he's in charge of the x-ray uh, uh, analysis so uh, our talk uh, concerns the x-ray strain analysis in macroelectronic devices and the outline of our talk uh, is the following. So we will start on the basis of strain stress analysis by X-ray diffraction. So a few equations. And then Jerome will show you some inline measurements uh, of strain, so in the clean room. And uh, then uh, I will present uh, how we can uh, uh, localize the strain uh, from X-ray analysis, uh, both thanks to uh, simulation and also using uh, 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 an amazing source, which is uh, the secreton source, which is not from metrology, but uh, well, it is interesting to, to, to have some information about that. Uh, so uh, why, why X-ray analysis, analysis uh, for strain uh, monitoring? So I would like first to mention that, uh, uh, so X-ray is an electronic, ele electromagnetic wave, so uh, uh, located between the gamma rays and the UV. And what is interesting with uh, this uh, radiation is that the X-ray energy is between 100 EV and 10 uh, mega electron volt. But mainly, uh, the most interesting is that the X-ray wavelength is between uh, 10 nanometers and 10 to the minus 3 nanometers. So it is very interesting because this wavelength is, clo is close, quite close to the lattice parameters we have to measure. So from different materials here for silicon, so the lattice parameters uh, is of uh, uh, 0.05 nanometer. So very close to the wavelength of X-ray. Uh, and the, uh, this is used uh, for, for X-ray analysis uh, since uh, the discovery of, uh, uh, from uh, Father and Son uh, Bragg, uh, who discovered at the beginning of the last century, this uh, uh, wonderful relationship between the Dispacing, so the, the distance between the, the lattice planes. Maybe you have a, a laser pointer. Uh, ah, thank you. Yeah. Okay, so uh, this relation, this uh, Bragg law uh, relied the, the, the distance between the lattice planes uh, and the uh, angle of diffraction, so the Bragg angle, uh, theta, which is the angle between the incident beam and uh, the planes of, uh, of atoms. Uh, so you have here the, the, the definition of the different parameters. So this Bragg law rely uh, lambda equal to 2d uh, sinus uh, theta. Uh, so how can we measure strain or stress by X-ray diffraction? First, I would like to say that uh, we only measure strain. Uh, so strain is defined like that. It's already down uh, this afternoon, but just a reminder. Uh, so if you apply a stress on a material, the length of the material will change from L0 to L, and the strain is defined uh, like this. So you measure strain, you can measure this difference of length, uh, and you then calculate only, this is the only way to have the stress, is to calculate the stress uh, from uh, the elastic properties of the materials. So here, in the simplest uh, case of uh, uniaxial stress, so the relationship between the stress and the strain is the Young modulus of the material but it can be more complex in general case. So uh, the idea for X-ray diffraction is to use the displacing uh, measured by X-ray diffraction, so through the Bragg law, uh, as a strain gauge. For, for example, here, if you have a material without stress, you can measure a D0 uh, displacing from a theta zero angle of diffraction. And if you apply a stress, the displacing will change, so you have a strain, and you will change the Bragg angle of, uh, of diffraction. So you can calculate the strain uh, mainly by calculating the displacing uh, variation uh, according to the uh, initial value of the, of the displacing. Uh, so you measure the strain displacing, and if you know the strain-free, what we call the strain-free uh, displacing, so D0, uh, you can calculate the strain. So this D0 can be uh, extracted from a database of material, but I will show you that we can also measure this D0 from X-ray analysis. 
Uh, in practical case, in fact, you have a Bragg peak and you measure the Bragg shift uh, from a relaxed position to unrelaxed position. And the strain is related to the Bragg sh angle shift through this uh, relationship. Uh, what is interesting to, to note is that if you look the strain in different direction, you have different uh, uh, behavior. Uh, for instance, here, if you apply the stress uh, parallel to the lattice, uh, lattice planes, in fact, you will have, you have an extension of the distance in the direction of the stress, but perpendicular to this uh, applied stress, you will have a retraction of the, of the, of the, uh, of the lattice spacing. So it's, uh, uh, it can be written uh, through this equation where the strain along this direction, so normal to the lattice plane, is equal to minus mu uh, divided by the Young modulus uh, multiplied by the stress. And uh, this coefficient is the Poisson ratio, which gives the relationship between the applied stress and the uh, um, uh, given strain uh, perpendicular to the stress. So uh, what is... To note here is that the strain displacing depends on the direction of, the, of observation uh, uh, versus the, the applied stress uh, on the material. So what does it mean? It means that uh, here for a, a strain-free, let's say polycrystalline layer, if you look at the displacing as function of the tilt angle, so consider that this uh, n direction is normal to the, to, the, to the sample, to the surface, uh, the displacing in these different these different grains in the material will be constant, whatever the, the, the direction side of observation. If now you applied a stress on this uh, on this polycrystalline layer, the displacing will vary with the, with the uh, psi angle. For instance, in that case, for a uh, uh, tensile in plane stress, the displacing for this grain will decrease, so along the, this psi gal zero, equal to zero direction. But if you increase the, the, the psi angle, the displacing will increase. So this is very interesting. And uh, we can generalize this, uh, this relationship to, to uh, the general case of strain tensor. So if now you have a general case of strain, so with the six uh, strain component of the strain tensor, uh, and you uh, look for one specific direction, so n defined by this angle, phi, which is the angle in the plane, and psi, the, the tilt of the, of the plane versus the normal to the surface. Uh, and if you look this train in this direction, so what we call also epsilon phi psi, <clears throat> so this epsilon phi psi, phi psi is defined by d phi psi mi, minus d0. Uh, if you do this projection using this strain tensor, we can define this strain versus the six component of, uh, of the strain tensor, uh, mixed, of course, with the phi and psi uh, angle of measurements. Uh, this is very interesting because it means that with X-ray, with X-ray diffraction, if we are able to measure different direction, so at least six independent phi psi direction, we are able to measure the complete strain tensor. So we have a complete strain tensor determination thanks to X-ray analysis. And if we applied on this strain tensor, the elastic constants, so the full elastic constants of the material here for the very general case, we are able to calculate the complete stress tensor. So this is the, 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 the I would say, this is the force of the X-ray analysis of the X-ray diffraction for stress analysis. So, uh, in the previous case, it was quite complicated. So we have six uh, strain and stress components, so quite complicated uh, case. But in case of uh, senior, it is, it is uh, much more uh, simple. Uh, because, well, when we are working on the thin layer, we can say that there is no stress along the normal to the surface. So no force applied along the, the Z of free direction. Uh, uh, so the sigma free free must be equal to zero in case of thin layer. In case of a single phase material for force equilibrium condition, we can say also that there is no shear strain in the material. So the, the, the component sigma 1, 3, sigma 2, 3 should be also equal to zero. And finally, if we have an isotopic, the actual state of stress in the plane of the layer, which is a quite common case, uh, it means that sigma 1, 1 is equal to sigma 2, 2 is equal to 
one stress value sigma. And from that, it, it, it comes that the shear stress sigma 1, 2 is equal to 0. So you see from the six component of stress, in case of thin layer, we only have one uh, unknown. And if we look now the previous relationship between strain and the different component of uh, strain or stress, it can reduce to this simple equation where the strain along the psi direction is given is lin it's, a, it's, it's a var the strain varies linearly with the uh, sinus square psi value and the stress applied on the material. So here the S2 and S1 uh, are what we call the uh, X-ray elastic uh, constants. I will come back on that later. Uh, what does it mean? It means that if we can measure the strain in at least two, three, two directions, but we can measure more than that, of course, uh, the slope of this relationship gives you directly through the elastic constant of the material, the stress in the layer. So this is what we call the sinus square psi uh, method, which is very well known in, uh, in, in, uh, in our uh, field. So uh, maybe one comment about the, 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 the S1 and S2, so the X-ray elastic constant. The problem is that for anisotropic material, the elastic properties depend on the HKL planes. So if you push on the 001 direction or on the 111 direction, you will not have the same strain result. So it means that the elastic constant we have to use uh, should depend on the, on the HKL and can be calculated through different models. I will not uh, detail here. Uh, there is one uh, specific case, the case of single crystal materials, and here we can use directly the single crystal elastic constant. For instance, here for very two basic case, so a cubic crystal with the uh, 001 orientation, the stress, the strain is related to the stress through this simple equation where S11, S12, and uh, S12 here again uh, are the elastic constants of the single crystal. And here you have this equation for the 111. Uh, I would like to finish my part here uh, saying two words about the, the, the fact that from this equation, we can also extract the stoichiometry of the material. Uh, why? Because, well, I say that the strain depends linearly, uh, uh, depend linearly with some square psi of the stress, where A and B are the elastic properties of the material. You can see there exists a specific psi angle, I note this psi zero, where the, psi, the, the, the strain should be equal to zero. And this specific direction only depends on the elastic properties of the material. So it means that uh, it means that cutting this uh, strain versus sinus square psi relationship, this point here gives you the lattice parameter, the stress-free lattice parameter of the material. So okay, at psi equal to zero, you get directly the lattice parameter of the material, the stress-free lattice parameter of the material. And from that, it depends, you can, uh, uh, the stress field lattice parameters can be related to a chemical stoichiometry of the material. Uh, and so using Vegard's law, we can extract the, the, the composition of the material, uh, for instance, if we have a, 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 an, an alloy. This is applied for many materials, silicon germanium, germanium tin, ingan, algan, uh, CDT, CDZNT material, and any alloy exhibiting a, a solid solution. Uh, so, uh, I, I let Jerome continue on, the, on that. Uh, just, I would like to finish on this part saying that this is the force of the X-ray diffraction to be able to measure not only the stress, but also the chemical content of the material. Thank you. So, derivative for this explanation. So, we, we see that we can um, measure strain derivative and diffraction. So, we want to apply it to inline metrology. Uh, here, I wanted to give you an overview of um, what we do at Leti. So we are developing materials for a semiconductor, uh, but I think I think the, the definition a nice overview of that. Uh, so we work on um, uh, 300 millimeter substrates, um, and we after a lot of uh, process steps, uh, so which imply, um, uh, for example, photolithography, uh, etching, uh, uh, epitaxy uh, deposition. So we have a, a, a complex 3D structure with, with a lot of materials, can be, uh, which can be polycrystallines, monocrystallines, or amorphous. Uh, 
with sizes down to 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 few nanometers. So we need uh, uh, to extract the strain because um, uh, uh, to extract the strain or the stress because it can uh, um, change during all the processes, and it's uh, difficult to find a, a metrology a solution uh, to be able to express this uh, uh, inside uh, uh, all this stack here. Um, so diffraction needs to be, uh, uh, there is some limitations. Uh, first, we need to work uh, on, on uh, crystalline material. So this is the first uh, uh, limitation. And the other one is, um, um, yeah, so, so, so two, two, two limitations. Uh, um, yes. <clears throat> um, Sorry. So, so yeah. So the, the, the other one is to be able to to extract uh, the strain inside the material. So to have a, um, a beam which is uh, small enough uh, to 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 be able to, uh, uh, to 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 extract here, yes, the the uh, the, the strain. Um, so the difficulties uh, here. Um, so first, first I, I start by by explaining a little bit more uh, what, what we can what we can do. Um, so diffraction can be seen here um, uh, simply by a Fourier transform. Uh, so we start from the uh, electron density of the lattice, and diffraction is just mathematically a, a Fourier transform. So we go from the direct space to the uh, um, to the reciprocal space here by just a, a, a simple conversion and uh, diffraction by moving the incoming beam and the diffracted beam you can just uh, uh, walk through the space and so by uh, uh, determining the, the distance or the position in the reciprocal space you can go back to the uh, real space and calculate the strain uh, the, the, the latest parameters and then the strain uh, if i so if I plot here, um, uh, if I take here the, 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 the example of the silicon, um, there is, uh, so, so I plot here uh, the, the position of the bright peaks of silicon. So due to the structural fracture, uh, um, all the bright uh, reflection are not available. So we have only a few ones. And also by, uh, uh, Geometries of, of, of the diffraction because we have uh, it's um, uh, reflecting reflecting uh, geometry. Um, we have only a few reflections that are available due to the limiting uh, of the of the of the wavelengths and also due to the incident and uh, diffracted beam that must be coming uh, uh, above the surface and exiting above the surface also. If now on this silicon, I put uh, uh, silicon germanium. So uh, if this is epitaxial, uh, I will have the same in-plane lattice parameter. And there will be uh, a compressive uh, stress, um, in, uh, an in-plane compressive stress. And so the out-of-plane uh, lattice parameter will, be, uh, will increase. And due to also diffraction, this will, this will create uh, uh, in the reciprocal space, uh, additional peaks, additional bright reflection here, which will be, so we are in a frequency domain, which will be below uh, the silicon peaks here. Now, if I start to, uh, for example, uh, with an increasing thickness, if I start to relax, uh, so the, 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 um, uh, the, st the stress uh, applied to the C layer will uh, uh, we, we, we will decrease. Uh, I will see the, the bright peak moving uh, from the fully strained uh, state to the relaxed state. So there will be an increase uh, uh, in the reciprocal space of the, 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 the QX position, the, the QZ position, and a decrease in the QX position. And so we see that by um, by uh, just looking at the position of the peaks here, 
will have the full comprehension of the of the of the strain uh, of the CG layer here. So how to easily extract the the, the um, uh, how to easily extract the strain here? We just have to uh, do a, a scan around those peaks here uh, by moving the uh, incoming beam and the detector and doing what we call a reciprocal space map. Um, if we have a 1D detector, so we can do it in one direction. It takes uh, um, uh, only 15 minutes, so down to 15 minutes. And this single RSMs uh, allow us to extract both in-plane and out-of-plane parameter. And as Patrice uh, showed, that we can, from those uh, uh, parameters, extract uh, relaxation and strain, and then by uh, using the, the Vegas law, uh, calculate the composition, and from the um, uh, mechanical parameter, uh, calculate the stress. Also, we see that we can have uh, some interference fringes uh, that can appear, which also can be explained by the, by the um, uh, Fourier transform. And from these fringes, we can extract also the thickness uh, of the layer. Uh, we can remind that uh, the sinus uh, square of psi method, or it, it, cor it corresponds here to the sinus uh, square of psi method because we have uh, from the uh, out of plane lattice parameter the one point here and one point for the in plane lattice parameter. And so we have access to the uh, strain, to the in plane strain uh, here. If we want to uh, have a more accurate uh, uh, um, uh, measurement, we can do like uh, 1D scan using uh, different optics. So what we call double axis or triple axis using a crystal to only analyze a parallel beam uh, coming from the from the sample. And then by, by extracting this 1D line, we can, for example, on, on this SIGI um, uh, sample, have uh, uh, a high resolution um, scan around the SIGI peak. And the position of the of the CG peak compared to the silicon here will give you, uh, uh, the, the, for example, the concentration and then uh, the stress. So the main parameter what we can extract from uh, inline measurement, so is thickness, composition, strain, and then uh, by calculation stress, and also the crystal quality uh, of the material. So what about um, X-ray sources? So to do, to, to do that, we need uh, uh, an X-ray source which is very intense. Um, uh, the problematic here, so the sources comes from the, uh, the, the first uh, uh, tube by, by uh, College in, in uh, 1914, uh, which uh, is a tungsten filament uh, where, which emits uh, electrons to a target uh, generally Cooper target, and then X-rays comes from uh, the, the Cooper targets. And this process uh, gives only around 1% of uh, the energy uh, transformation, gives only 1% of X-rays. So there is a lot of heat generated. And so it's difficult to have a high flux source. Um, another model exists, which is a rotating anode. So by uh, moving the target, you um, avoid uh, getting too much heat, and you allow the system to, to cool down. But uh, yeah, it, you cannot produce a, a, a very small uh, source, a very, very small spot with a high uh, uh, intensity. So generally, we have uh, up between 10 to the power of 7 and 10 to the power of 9 uh, uh, photon per second. And we can go down to uh, around uh, 40 micron spot size. Also, we have access to different elements, so we can increase uh, the size of the award fair to be able to have a lot of uh, diffraction, uh, uh, Bragg reflection. And uh, Patrice, we talk more about the synchrotron facility where you can have higher flux. Um, so two manufacturers um, propose uh, equipment uh, which combines both large and large beam and micro spots. Uh, large beam uh, will be around one by ten uh, millimeter, and uh, micro spot will be converging uh, beam by around fifty by fifty micrometer square. Uh, those 
equipment so is uh, uh, fully automated from from the loading to the alignment and they are fully capable to uh, load 300 millimeter uh, wafer along with a small substrate also so this is a really nice tool to have because you will uh, have fast diffraction uh, uh, capacity and also you will be able to make a, a 1d rsm so fast 1d rsm down to 15 minutes uh, rsm and a few hours if you have very low uh, thickness uh, samples this is um one example I can I can, get, I can uh, give. Um, so this is a gallium nitride and silicon here. Uh, so this is an hexagonal material, uh, which is uh, mostly used for uh, poorer application or LED, also radio frequency. Uh, the problematic with uh, gallium nitride is that, uh, um, as it is hexagonal, you cannot uh, just uh, do an epitaxy on silicon. So you need to adapt uh, the, the latest parameter from uh, aluminum nitride to the gallium nitride here by a thick buffer. So this is uh, what we call um, uh, um, strain engineering to uh, be able to progressively relax uh, the stack uh, up to the gallium nitride and have a layer which is which has the lowest possible value of, uh, um, of uh, dislocation. So this is uh, the stack overview, and you see that by uh, doing diffraction, we get uh, in one uh, measurement uh, all the back peak corresponding to the uh, layers here, from uh, aluminum nitride to the gallium nitride here. And if you have uh, your uh, algan uh, barrier here, uh, which is part of your device, you will be able to extract the position, so the, 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 the distance between this barrier to, the, to your substrate, and then be able to get the strain uh, and then the stress, and also composition. Uh, this is what we did here. So uh, we followed during a, a, a lead process fabrication. Uh, so we, we, we monitored it. We monitored the gallium uh, nitride by uh, diffraction. And uh, we saw that first, uh, so this is blanket sample. We start from blanket sample. We see that we have a, um, we have a compressive uh, uh, strain here. And when we start to uh, etch and make the LEDs and adding some other uh, material like uh, copper lines, we go from a, a compressive str strain to a tensile strain. So we see here uh, that uh, um, uh, following the, the strain during process is really uh, important. Also, it should be noted that uh, uh, we did the measurements here with a large beam on uh, an array of uh, LEDs. So this is one, possi one possibility to measure the strain inside small, uh, small uh, uh, pattern. Uh, here, so if we go back to uh, CG uh, uh, material, um, if you want to follow the process, we can use um, uh, what we call a metrology box here to measure uh, uh, inside uh, inside a, a specific layer because you cannot uh, measure it on transistor, which will be uh, uh, um, too difficult to measure. So here we sh we show that <laughs> we can uh, extract in a, a really quick RSM uh, the position here of the CG layer. Uh, uh, compared to uh, the silicon. This is here a little bit specific because this is a SOI layer, but we are able to extract the, 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 the concentration and also the thickness of this uh, CG layer. And, um, and, and this is uh, really important, but uh, sometimes uh, the strains can change if you change the, the, the dimension of your, uh, of your pattern. So this is why, this is what, uh, Maybe uh, Patrice will uh, talk about. Okay, thank you, Jerome. So uh, I would like here to apologize because uh, we didn't discuss with Delphine about uh, our presentation uh, before this call. Uh, and here I will present to you a, a work we supervise uh, with Delphine. Uh, in, uh, it was uh, the PhD of uh, Aurel Durand, so uh, uh, the defense were in, uh, in 2016. Uh, and uh, well, uh, in this in this PhD, as shown by by, by Delphine already, uh, we were interested by the the strain and stress in silicon germanium layer, so uh, epitaxial layer on silicon. Uh, 
And uh, as uh, uh, Jerome said to you, in that case, in the case of a blanket uh, film, uh, the stress transfer is quite simple. We only have the, an in-plane strain and an out-of-plane strain. So in terms of a reciprocal space map, we have this kind of thing. So we have the substrate uh, in, uh, in uh, green and the film in, in red, so the silicon germanium in red. And uh, in the case here for uh, in red, in, for the case of uh, unrelaxed layer and in blue for a relaxed one. Uh, well, if now we are going to pattern structure, and this is a, a very interesting case, uh, and a, an important case, in fact, uh, we have different uh, phenomenon appearing. The first one is that we have an edge on, 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 on the film, and so we, it means that we have no stress uh, along at this, at this edge uh, in, in the plane of the, of the film. So we have a relaxation, and this will uh, also uh, provoke a rotation of the, of the lattice planes. So it means that in the reciprocal space now, uh, we always have the, the, the silicon peak, of course, so uh, symmetrical and asymmetrical. And here for the, the silicon germanium layer, we will have some, uh, some uh, uh, wings around this, uh, this spot, so the, uh, this uh, banana shape, in fact. Uh, and this is due to the rotation of the plane at the edge of the, of the, of the, of the line, and also due to the relaxation at this, uh, at this edge. Uh, Moreover, since we are working on uh, uh, line gratings, uh, we, ha we have uh, what we call super lattice effect, and uh, the, 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 the spot uh, appears like that with some fringes, the distance between the fringes, uh, given the, the, the distance between the lines here. Uh, so it is a little bit more difficult to extract strain in that case, because we don't have an homogeneous layer, but now we have a strain field inside this uh, this uh, silicon germanium lines. So how can we do that? So yes, we have also some uh, effect in the in the substrate because we have inhomogeneous strain in the in the line. It induces some in inhomogeneous strain uh, inside the the, the, the silicon substrate and induces also these uh, fringes we can see around the the, the silicon peak. Uh, so how can we do to extract the strain in the case of inhomogeneous uh, lines? Uh, the idea. As mentioned by Delphine previously, uh, 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 is to is to well to say that uh, the relationship between a strain crystal in direct space and what we measure in the reciprocal space is only a Fourier transform of the real space. So the point is, how can we relocalize the strain inside this reciprocal space map and to come to the real single crystal. So this is the point. And the idea developed by uh, uh, Aurel uh, was the following. But before that, I would like to show you a nice example of comparison between uh, uh, TEM measurements. Uh, so Roberto just uh, explained you uh, that we can use what we call dark field electron holography to measure the strain field inside a, a, a structure. And here to prove you that Inside the reciprocal space map, we have the information, the localized information of the strain. Uh, we perform a Fourier transform of this uh, dark field electron uh, holography image. Uh, so we use the uh, atomic position inside this layer and perform a trans Fourier transform. Um, and this is the reciprocal space map we obtain from that. So it looks like the kind of uh, a reciprocal space I showed you just before. And then we can compare this, uh, so RSM calculated from fast wave transform and the measured one, so with X-ray diffraction. So it looks like it's quite similar, but not completely. As you can see, we have a mismatch in terms of QZ position of the fringes for the silicon germanium layer here from, uh, from, from between diffraction and, and, uh, and uh, TM. This is due to the uh, slice effect, as uh, explained by Roberto also. It may knew that, uh, that perpendic to, to perpendicular to the slice, you don't have uh, any stress. So this will induce a relaxation. And this, is, uh, this explains this uh, mismatch between uh, TM and diffraction. But we can do simulation. Uh, he said that we can do simulation to recalculate the effect of relaxation to, to, to suppress this relaxation effect. And this is what, what we, we did here. And we, we have a nice uh, correspondence now 
between TM and diffraction. Uh, and here we have the same result, but uh, for the different fridges here. So before uh, taking into account the relaxation and after taking into account this relaxation. So it means that the local field is really in the reciprocal space map. So the idea uh, of Aurel was to, uh, to use a finite element model, so uh, to modelize the strain, the displacement field inside a structure, to modelize a crystalline structure, so uh, defining the uh, atomic position inside the structure, and perform a Fourier tron apply, sorry, apply on this crystalline structure the uh, displacement field calculated by uh, uh, FEM. And so we get this result. And from this result, which is the atomic position plus the strain, we can apply a Fourier transform and calculate the reciprocal space map from that. And here you have a comparison. I'm not sure it's better than the one you showed previously. Uh, it's a comparison between the simulated uh, reciprocal space map and, and the experimental one. So it's, uh, the comparison is quite uh, interesting. Uh, but the problem of that is that the quite, uh, it's a time-consuming methodology, which is not compatible with a fast inline control. Uh, OK, so I I'm going fast. Uh, so I say by Belfin, we developed a library, so with different parameters, and we match the simulation from uh, FEM and uh, the experimental result to get the, the, the final results. So it's possible to find, uh, uh, to localize the strain uh, through a reciprocal space map. But the point is that the result we have here is only an average result over a large field of nano devices. So the question now is, can we go further and get information at the scale of one nano device? Oh, sorry. So this can be done using this amazing source we have, which, which called the synchrotron. Um, so it's a large scale facilities where we accelerate, accelerate electrons. And these electrons, uh, when uh, uh, turning around uh, a circle, uh, produce some uh, photons. And we can use this photon to do uh, X-ray photons to perform uh, diffraction. What is very interesting with uh, X-ray synchrotron source is the brilliance of the source. Here you have an ex uh, you will have the brilliance of a lab source, so 10 to the 7, 10 to the 9, even 10 to the 10 photon per second. And here you have the brilliance of a, a secreton source here at ESRF, where you see that the difference is of 10,000 of billions times brighter than a lab source. So very, very intense source. And the interest of that is that you can uh, produce very, very small beam. And today, after the upgrade uh, performed at SRF in 2020, uh, you have beam size of 20 to 30 square nanometers. So it means that you can do measurement at this scale with this source. It means, for instance, that you can do what we call scanning diffraction X-ray microscopy. In fact, this is the same measurement we showed you in the lab. So Jerome showed you some results. I showed you some but with this special resolution of 30 nanometers, and we can have a field of view of few square microns. There are also techniques like coherent diffraction imaging. I will not detail here, I don't have time, but we can also use a very nice, very recent and very nice technique, which is called dark field X-ray microscopy. It's a full field approach. And with this technique, we have a special resolution of 30 to 100 nanometers, but also a field of view of few hundred of square microns. And if I have a few minutes, I don't know, <laughs> I would like to show you one example. So this is an example we performed uh, two or three years ago. Uh, so at ESRF on an uh, uh, infrared camera. So the infrared camera is done with an active layer of uh, AGCDT, so 111 oriented. It's a single crystal layer, six micron thick. Uh, we have some pixel on this camera. We have some pixel of uh, 15 micron uh, size. And this camera, this infrared camera, worked at uh, uh, liquid nitrogen temperature. And this is hybridized uh, through indium bumps on a readout uh, integrated circuit. And the point is that during the, li the, the lifetime of this uh, camera, some pixels uh, become defective. And the point is to understand why some pixels become defective. So we need to do, for that to, understand that, to understand that, we need to do operando measurement, so at uh, this temperature, so uh, 80K at the pixel size to measure different pixel, but also with a large field of view because we don't know which pixel will come will become defective or not. So we need to measure a few hundreds of pixels. 
So we can do with this uh, technique, which is called the dark field X-ray microscopy. So the idea is to use a parallel beam, monochromatic and parallel beam, to put in diffraction the layer. So here the HECDT layer, MCT, what we call the MCT layer, get the diffraction beam and go through what we call an X-ray lens. And, and so to magnify the X-ray beam and to measure the image of the beam on the detector, which is positioned six meters away from the lens. So, uh, well, I'll come back on that later. So we perform that at uh, ID1 at ESRF. And what is very interesting is that we have a field of view of 250 microns, so we can measure 300 uh, pixels uh, in one shot. Uh, with a spatial resolution better than 150 nanometers and a strain resolution of about 10 to the minus four. Yeah, I just, just finished. So the idea is to perform oscillation of the sample. And I want to show you that. So here we, we do this working curve and you will see the different pixel lights up when, enter, when the, the pixel enters in diffraction. So you have here different pixels, so many, many pixels, which are diffracting one after the other when we do this working curve. And if we look, I will finish maybe on that. If we look what happened when at different temperatures, so here at room temperature down to 80K, we can see clearly that at 80K, the diffraction becomes starts before the other temperature and finish after the other temperature. So it means that the distortion of pixel increase with cooling. So we can see with this technique, each pixel uh, uh, moving during the, 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 the cooling down of the sample. We measure that during cooling and warming. And what is very interesting is that we see that the sample seems to be more and more distorted. But we, when we warm up the sample, it comes back to the initial state. We measure the stress in this layer. We found that the stress is very, very low, about a few megapascal. And uh, well, we finally uh, uh, prove that the main effect is the disorientation of, the, of this uh, MCT layer on top of the Indian bumps. And so what happened? Uh, I will finish on that. What happened? <laughs> sorry. <laughs> What happened is that, in fact, these indium bumps uh, are very anisotropic in terms of uh, thermal expansion coefficient. And in fact, it means that some, uh, when we cool down the sample, some indium bumps will uh, shrink more than others. And so the initial flat layer will become wavy like that. And this explains what we observe through this uh, dark field technique. I will not show you that. I will just go to my conclusion. So saying that uh, I think that I'm working in that field, or maybe I'm not very, <laughs> I'm not sure I'm, I'm the best uh, to, do, to say that, but uh, X-ray diffraction is a unique tool for strain and stress analysis in semiconductor. We can get the full strain and stress. We can have information about the chemical content. We can use that on blanket film, but we can also perform local strain analysis. We can do measurement at the scale of a wafer or at a few tens of nanometers. And we also can do in situ and in operando measurements uh, using, of course, synchrotron source. Thank you for uh, your attention. I would like to acknowledge some colleagues from Leti Delphine from the uh, supervising uh, the PhD of Aurel with me, uh, Giancarlo for some measurements, uh, and uh, uh, Tao Zhu for the SRF measurements. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, and let's go to the last presentation for today, which is... Okay, I'm here. Harold, so, yeah, Harold. No problem, no problem, I'm here. Uh, let me share my screen. Yes, we can see you, so... Let's wait, give me a second. Yes. Okay, nearly there. Okay. Can you see my screen? Yes. We can see your yes, yes we can see your presentation. Yeah. Excellent, excellent, excellent. Okay, very good. Uh, so um 
what, what I'm going to do, try and do today is to uh, explain to you something about plasmonics and how it's uh, applicable to the important areas that are uh, critical in this consortium, okay? So um, uh, basically, uh, I want to start with uh, how we designed the instrument for uh, uh, this consortium, okay? And uh, what we suggested that is shown on the left-hand side at the very beginning of the consortium and, and the system as it looks today uh, after its integration, okay? This is what was realized. Now, there are certain important things about how you construct such an instrument, especially because what we want to do with the instrument, we want to integrate it fully into the, the one of the very good methodologies uh, of looking at uh, a strain in, in silicon, and that's Raman. I must say I was quite uh, uh, surprised in the previous presentation to see that a uh, uh, a, uh, a beam from a synchrotron can achieve a few tens of nanometers. That I never heard before. And I, I, I worked a lot on uh, concentrating x-rays. And, uh, and, and, and I don't, I, I must say, if you can send me what, how this is done, I'm very interested in it, okay? But in any event, let's continue. Okay, so there are certain important aspects to building such a system. The first thing is that you should have, uh, you know, stages that have high resonance frequency for moving in X and Y. And this is the design of those stages. This is how we designed what we were going to do. And th this is the, uh, uh, the, um, the, the stages that I'm explaining with high resonance frequency, but they can move quite fast, but they don't have very good Z range. So we have a stage on top of it, which you can readily see, which is only seven millimeters thin, which can move up to 100 uh, uh, microns in Z, okay, which is very unusual and very important for uh, um, for, uh, you know, for, it's very important for, uh, for deep trenches and things like that in semiconductor industry. And uh, th this is uh, from a, a movie. For some reason, my movies are not being uh, uh, seen very well today. I don't know why, what's going on. Uh, but in any event, you can see these two lines. That's a, a scan that was done by that probe or over 100 microns. And each... Uh, and each of the stages have a 100 micron range. So with those stages, you can add the AFM. This is the AFM. It includes one of these very thin stages. So you have both uh, the, a stage for the sample and a stage for the probe. And you can scan the probe or you can scan the sample. Actually, in Raman scattering, you need to scan the sample. OK, because you want to go pixel by pixel. And uh, uh, but but this is what the design of the AFM looks like. And this is the integration of it into the stages and the optical microscope. For ease of use, again, if when you go to the, the site, you can hit this and you'll be able to see a movie, uh, you can uh, there, there is a magnet here that holds the upper microscope, and we have a very interesting methodology that we've incorporated here, where you can un, uh, uh, unlock it, and you can send the, the, the top microscope backwards and open up the entire region of the, uh, the AFM and the, the sample stage, etc., uh, for ease of changing uh, elements. Now, the whole system has to be really isolated. Uh, the first isolation is a vibration isolation. The vibration isolation uh, occurs 
and not due to the optical table. The optical table is a pretty bad thing because it, uh, it, it, it gives you lots of low frequency. It, it amplifies building low frequency vibrations. And so on top of that is sitting an active table on which there's a breadboard and on which the entire system is built. So uh, the system is built on that table, okay? It has the optical microscope as we described. It has the AFM, it has the stage. Now, um, this device here is a device that sends the light down from an external source that's coming from the uh, from the right. That's the green arrow that you see. Okay, but what's very important about this is this uh, this methodology that we've incorporated uh, to isolate the noises that are connected with the spectrometer. Because if you go back here, all of this is sitting on an optical table. The spectrometer, the lasers, the CCD are also sitting on the optical table, but they're not isolated like the AFM is. The AFM is built on top of this uh, of this system. So what we do is we do something interesting in this design. We have this shelf on which the oculars are, and we make a special device which is seen here, and this device. Uh, is not connected. If you can see, as there's a separation between the uh, optical elements here and the the ocular, and it passes light back and forth. And even though there may be vibrations in this direction uh, because of the uh, uh, of what's on the table, the lasers, the CCD fans, and so on and so forth, because the lenses. Uh, infinity corrected. You see none of that in this design. In this design. So basically, what you're seeing here is the light that is uh, uh, going. In this case, entering the mirror assembly. These mirror assemblies are, are are over here, and they go into this assembly, which then brings it down. And so both the light. For excitation of the Raman and the light for collection of the Raman uh, go through these same paths. So, in addition to the system, the, uh, we prefer, although you don't have to prefer this, uh, the probes, tro probes that are transparently integrated into optics and spectroscopy. So, uh, we prefer probes made out of glass that we put a lot of effort in and we've incorporated into this system. This is an AFM probe. It is completely transparent, okay? This is a glass-based uh, plasmonic probe. And uh, I don't know if you can read, this is 100 nanometers. This is less than 100 nanometers and it's a gold nanoparticle on the, uh, on the, on the system. The the cantilevering of these probes is such that they do not block any of the light from the lens above. So this system of AFM is totally integrated into standard optical microscopy. Most AFMs don't have standard optical microscopes. They are blocked by their scanners from the top. And uh, for that matter, most silicon probes don't allow light from the top either. So for semiconductor analysis, really this methodology that we've introduced into this system in the ERC is actually very good, okay? You also have probes of glass that can give you near field optical uh, methodologies independent of Raman, such as PL, okay? You have electrical probes, which are platinum wires and uh, they are can be made as coaxes and they even micro and nano thermocouples. If you want to see the data on what was obtained with the system, uh, uh, we have a, a report that uh, is going to be uploaded very in the next probably 24 hours uh, that is very connected to how I'm giving this presentation. 
So you'll be able to see some of the data that we're talking about. Now, um, in addition to the system and the probes, there's a feedback that is chosen for transparently integrating into optics and spectroscopy. Specifically, there are two types of feedback that can be used. One is based on tuning forks, and one is uh, based upon amplitude measured by a laser beam bouncing off a cantilever. That's the conventional method, okay? The tuning forks have great advantages. They don't have any jump to contact. They have very, very high force constants. These are very weak force constants. So when you come very close to a surface, there is a jump to contact of, of, of the system. And so uh, basically, you cannot uh, keep a probe, uh, you know, if even a few nanometers from a surface with such a probe. With such a probe, you can bring it to less than an angstrom and it will not touch the surface. And therefore, you can flip between SDM and AFM. And this has been shown with this system too. This is more about the, the uncontrolled ringing of the adhesion forces. This is more, more concerned with elasticity, and I won't go into that right now. The, the tuning fork has very high Q, uh, Q factors, which give you ultra sensitivity. <coughs> and they have been used up to uh, measuring less than a piconewton uh, of a force. Uh, less than a piconewton force is the force of a photon. So you can understand how sensitive they are, okay? And there is no, when you use a tuning fork, and this is important for our spectroscopy, there's no feedback laser for the, the case where you have silicon. And therefore, you have a, um, uh, uh, a no interference with the Raman, and you can change the Raman laser in, in any way that you want without changing any of the capabilities of the system or any of the methodologies of feedback because this uses a laser uh, for feedback. Moreover, what has been found is that in semiconductors, the lasers that are used here, which are in the near red, actually induce uh, carriers and that is giving gives artifacts in the system. Furthermore, an important characteristic for uh, 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 th this, the system is that you get very high numerical aperture lenses so you can collect Raman. Raman is notorious. It's notorious for a weak signal, okay? And that's not good for what we want it for, okay? We'll show methodologies that we're, that hopefully this consortium will bring to fruition that will uh, uh, allow us to go beyond the weak signals. But with a tuning fork, you can get up to 0 0.9, which is the largest numerical aperture you can get in air with a working distance of one millimeter. So you can actually have a unified solution which advant with, with advantages for what is called tip-enhanced Raman scattering because of plasmonics or tip-enhanced PL because of plasmonics. And you'll see what I mean in a minute. Firstly, as we said, you can use a silent uh, feedback mechanism like a tuning fork. And in fact, in this paper, uh, a tuning fork and a beam bounce was used for some other methodology. So what I want to in indicate from this is that uh, tuning forks and, and, and beam bounce uh, doesn't really, uh, uh, you know, can, can be in the same system. I haven't included it in this system in our discussion, but uh, the, the system that has been designed can have more than one probe associated with it. I just didn't want to take additional time to explain the second probe. But these probes can kind of come into physical contact with one another. So now the plasmonic nature of the, the, the tip, which is a gold, uh, a gold glass nanoparticle, okay, uh, gives you a very interesting methodology because the, 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 the cantilever here is made out of glass. So the glass cantilever has no scattering like silicon probes. 
And this has been shown by Ramos and Gordon on their own system. They built their own system. And they say that uh, the probes that are used with silicon, even those that have a slightly exposed uh, tip, okay, uh, are, uh, uh, have light scattering by the tip shaft, which can be considerable. And the use of tips with smooth or transparent shafts are recommended. And this is what the probes that we have chosen in our uh, emulation. So these probes, okay, have been used previously, okay, and uh, uh, the, uh, such a probe is resonant with 532 nanometer uh, radiation, which is a very convenient wavelength. Uh, moreover, uh, the, um, uh, the, the way, way the system is built, meaning that you have a probe scanner and a sample scanner, sample scanning under the lens for the, uh, 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 for, for the Raman, or for that matter, anything, because the lenses are totally rot rotatable and other methodologies uh, of optical uh, inspection can be applied very readily. In fact, this device is called a UDP, which allows you to have multiple paths going into the system. And uh, this is, uh, th uh, this, is uh, uh, for, uh, uh, for, this is for enhanced Raman uh, on uh, molybdenum sulfide, and this is uh, for uh, tip enhanced PL, and uh, basically uh, what is said over here is that an interesting aspect of the system uh, that, uh, that have been applied to, to tip enhanced methodologies is that you are able to do a difference, either the tip up and down or the tip moved. And you, for that, you need a tip scanner to keep the sample exactly in the same position relative to the lens. Also, it has been found that if you don't enca 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 encapsulate the gold in glass, then you start seeing electron transfer when you bring these tips very close to the surface. And that's another advantage to using such probes. In collaboration with Semitech, we have a, uh, a gratings that were made by Semitech of strain silicon on silicon. This is a 60 nanometer grating. And uh, in the far field, you don't see anything, but you need a, a, a plasmonic probe in order to see it. So this is a summary of the above slides. A choice of either beam bounce or tuning fork, okay, with the tuning fork having certain advantages. TERS and SPM probes with transparent shafts for reduction of scattering and no Raman background. Online probe and sample for different stirs. Glass encapsulated gold nanoparticle preventing electron transfer from the tip to the sample with highest stirs enhancement. Semitech qualified samples for TERS probe characterization. And any illumination geometry. Some people like for, I won't go into why, they like side illumination because they can get some uh, polarizations that you can add a Z polarization, which uh, really is not necessary. But anyway, that's another story. So an application, for example, is getting high resolution single layer graphene, okay? Uh, and you can see the, 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 the this is, in contact, this is out of contact, this is difference, okay? And it, uh, and you can go from a, a single layer to a multi-layer, that's this, this line over here, and it works very well for graphene. You can also have, depending on the G band of graphene, you can uh, actually follow the doping with about 50 nanometer resolution. That means the G band changes in the, Far field, you don't see anything. Only with the plasmonic probe can you see those dots. This is a, 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 an example of imaging of strain silicon. It's uh, not done with this system, 
but I'm including it because it shows you the potential for the future. It, uh, it, it shows you, for example, these are 2D images, okay? And this is a 3D image, and it depends on the wavelength, uh, the, the, the wave number of, of the band. If it's uh, at 520 wave numbers, which is, of course, silicon, then you see this contrast. These are collages of the intensity of the Raman with the 3D. And this is a 503 wave numbers, which is a sample we got from a, an, an industrial place, which allowed us to use it. I've never seen such a low strain silicon, uh, 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 you know, wave num uh, uh, you know, vibrational frequency. But you can see that the distribution is totally different depending on whether you're looking at silicon or strain uh, or, uh, or strain silicon. So what it, let, let's get some insight to what is this TERS mechanism. What happens? Well, the point is that when you look, you take a probe, okay, and you bring it and you have an, a, a gold particle. Gold is a highly polarizable material, especially uh, in a plasmonic sense. What is the meaning of it in a plasmonic sense? There are no plasmons until you hit it with light, okay? And when the light hits the gold nanoparticle, you have a plasmonic uh, uh, in, in induction in the particle, which causes a polarization and a, polar, a polarization in molecules. In fact, molecules that undergo strong polarization are in fact the best to those materials. And, and strain silicon is one of them actually, material that goes undergoes a large polarization change. Because the intensity of Raman scattering depends on the intensity of the uh, um, uh, of the initial beam, okay, with the wavelength to the fourth, like any scattering method, and the polarizability tensor, and that's why the polarizability tensor has such a strong influence on what you see. So let's see if we can get some more insights into the Turner's mechanism. The, uh, the, this is molybdenum and sulfide on three types of materials, okay? On glass, on polymer, on silicon. I said on gold, I do have it. You'll see it in the next slide, okay? Here is different materials, but also different wavelengths. This is a wavelength at 785 nanometers of the same material on the same substrate and what it looks like at 532, okay? And this is a, an example of silicon with 785, okay? And uh, I'm sorry, this is an example, all of this is a molybdenum sulfide, excuse me. This is on silicon and this is on gold. So depending on the wavelength and depending uh, on the material for that matter, on which the sample is sitting, you see different enhancement, okay? But one of the things that is very uh, definitive about TERS, nearly generally, okay, is the fact that the intensity only changes, not the frequency of the band. So one of the best methods actually to see TERS is STM. And uh, as, as I said, these systems have no jump to contact. And you can flip between AFM and STM in the system, okay? So TERS is particularly successful with tunneling feedback, okay? It, tunneling feedback can create plasmons. There could be a causative effect, but that causative effect is, is at a very large voltage, okay? And a very high current. Basically, TERS occurs at much lower voltages, millivolts, and in, in uh, uh, picoamp currents. And as you uh, uh, change the current from, say, one picoamp to 500 picoamps, on the same material, the TERS signal starts to increase. But notice, the value of the, of the, of the band hasn't changed at all, OK? So TERS is produced with much lower voltages and currents than the causative effect of tunneling electrons, okay? And 
when you increase the current, okay, you can see based upon the, the equation, the distance becomes smaller and smaller. And therefore, as the distance becomes smaller, the tip comes closer and closer. And therefore, an effect occurs on the material that increases the TERS effect. The same tip, the same sa sample, just the distance. That's why tunneling, and um, that's why even AFM with a, uh, with, a, with a tuning fork works much better. So tunneling results that uh, indicate that as a tip gets closer and closer, the intensity of the signal increases. This explains the success of tunneling and tuning fork AFM. Now there's another thing that people have seen. In really pioneering work by Bamber uh, from uh, Cambridge, okay, uh, he has shown that if you bring two gold balls together, you uh, you have what is called a Fano resonance. Uh, it's like a hybrid state in in molecular uh, uh, you know theory, and you can see that as the distance of the balls become closer and closer. You can see clearly that the the the, the actual uh, spectrum changes. Okay, so perturbed optical absorption and hybrid states occur in both noble metal and semiconductor materials that are closely approached with the tip. Okay, so what we see over here is that uh, you get a hybrid state. The hybrid state is like a new molecule. Because the, the distances we're talking about are angstroms. And that's, uh, if, you, if you even look at a hydrogen, hydrogen molecule, the, the hydrogen, you know, uh, is 0 0.5 uh, angstroms, okay? So we're talking about angstroms generally in, 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 in molecules. And we know that chemistry is based upon changing the electronic nature of molecules. So how could such spectral shifts occur? And how can they specifically affect intensity, but not frequency? So you must understand where Raman scattering comes from. Raman scattering comes from the overlap between the ground state and the excited virtual state. This is a virtual state that only exists when the photon is there, okay? So if you now, uh, 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 without the probe, the virtual state is here, and this is certain energy here, okay? And now you bring the probe, uh, the probe tip uh, uh, to the sample, you can in fact shift the virtual state. And now the distance between the ground state and the virtual state is larger than what it is without the probe. And therefore, the absorption has changed. If you bring that probe even closer, you can change it to another overlap. These are called Frank Condon overlaps. For those you know who are not familiar with molecular uh, uh, terminology, they're the overlap of the, the, the envelope between the ground and, in this case, the virtual excited state. But notice one thing, that the nuclear coordinate hasn't changed at all. This is a, a, uh, a, a nuclear coordinate, which is exactly unchanged. That means the frequency is unchanged. So, um, so electronic shifts can occur like this. And how are these related uh, to Raman scattering? In Raman scattering, as I said, you have the intensity related to the polariz uh, uh, polariz polarizability of the molecule or the material. And the polarizability of the material is related to what is called the Raman tensor. The Raman tensor can be explained by second order perturbation theory in the following way. This and this are the overlap between those uh, th these regions, okay? And uh, this is a, uh, the connection between the overlap. It's, the, it, it's basically the, 
uh, change in the Hamiltonian with the Q of that particular uh, overlap. But look at what the, 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 the numerator is. The numerator depends on the wavelength of the excitation relative to this energy. So as the wavelength gets closer and closer to the energy, you get this denominator approaching zero and the Raman tensor goes to infinity, the polarizability tensor goes to infinity and the intensity goes to infinity. Obviously, it never goes to infinity, but that's that's the, uh, the essence of this math, okay? So, those spectral effects, like those in resonance Raman enhancements, can explain the alterations in ground state vibrational frequencies with large intensity, the, no alterations, I'm sorry, in ground state vibrational frequencies with large intensity alterations, okay? And this is really, uh, I, uh, most people will not believe me what I'm saying right now. So don't, you know, take any notes because you probably, it's probably wrong, but I, I, I believe I'm right. Okay. But in any event, um, the bottom line is that this is my interpretation of TERS because sometimes you see TERS, sometimes you don't see TERS. And it depends on whether you are dealing with a material a, a tip which is polarizable and the distance of the tip to the surface which changes the absorption and therefore the resonance enhancement of the uh, 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 of the denominator and therefore uh, actually being able to see TERS. That means that sometimes when you don't see TERS, you say, oh, the tip is not good. No, 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 no. Are you using the right laser? It's a very complicated process, I believe. And uh, as we learn more and more about it, we are able to apply it better and better. So, yeah. Let's continue. I'm finished. I have just one or two slides left. Um, uh, so, where uh, does this in, uh, in trans uh, so we we see that TERS gives you a large intensity, but Raman has a low signal. But even this large intensity is not good enough. Okay, if you really want to do any industrial application to it, so challenges in a very exciting way uh, suggested to look at the future, and they brought in uh, the Nova Corporation. Okay, now I want to just show you just some initial, very initial results we got on, on a sample that Nova gave us that they got from Grafenea, okay? Uh, as you see, uh, the red is the, uh, the TERS signal. The blue is the normal signal without the tip, okay? But now watch that, this frequency here for TERS, okay? The actual position of the of that uh, the TERS signal, okay, is it, it is moving around a little bit. It still looks as if if you take it on a very qualitative basis, uh, it, it's it, it's it's exactly in the same place. But this may give us because it could be due to scattering effects. It could be due to numerous other factors. But this could give us a way to teach from the far field where the TERS signal and its enhancement is going to occur. Because this is a band with many frequencies in it. And it's not that, that you're enhancing this frequency and it's moving. It could be a frequency here that's being uh, actually enhanced. So it really moves. and. Uh, and, and really, we uh, look very much forward to, uh, you know, Nova's talk tomorrow. I don't know if they'll actually speak about this, but if they do, it will be very interesting for us because, uh, and, and we, are, we are in touch with them. Obviously, we are both in Israel. Uh, and, and we really hope uh, that due to the stimulation of uh, this ERC Challenges Grant in the future, we will see more and more in interaction and, and therefore, join our uh, knowledge of Raman to their knowledge of AI. 
in order to get learning sets that are effective. And so I thank you for your attention and uh, I, I look forward to hearing a lot more from you all tomorrow, okay? Okay. So let me stop sharing. I don't know how you stop sharing. How do I stop sharing? Let me see. Uh, excuse me. Okay. Okay, I stopped sharing. I think I stopped sharing. So Does anyone let me just share with you the agenda for tomorrow? Okay. Is there any questions, by the way? I'm glad to answer it. So we will start at nine sharp. So yep. please be here a bit before that. Okay. I will be here like around 8.30, more or less, to check everything. So okay. uh, tomorrow we'll start at 9 sharp and have a nice evening. Thank you. Bye. I have already asked if someone has questions. There are no questions from the chat. So no questions, Aaron. Thank you. No problem, no problem.